to begin. All right, I would like to go ahead and call uh, this city council meeting. It's a regular session to order. Um, can we start with the roll call, please? Absolutely. Mayor Bagley, sure. obviously you're here. Council Member Christensen. Here. Council Member Hidalgo Faring. Here. Council Member Martin. Here. Council Member Peck. Here. Council Member Rodriguez. Here. Council Member Waters. Here. Mayor, you've got a quorum. All right, great. Um, Harold, remember that, day, that, that week, about three weeks ago, where you didn't say the pledge and you decided to go on mute? Would you please lead us with the pledge tonight? I was not on mute last time. I know, but I, I remember. I remember. <laughs> go ahead and lead it off for us. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. and to the republic for which it stands, and one nation, one nation under God, God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. For all. all right. Good job, Harold. Thanks. All right. Uh, quick reminder to the public, if you want to call in, call in when you see the, the sign on your screen. Just follow the instructions. That one right there. So dial the, the, the number and then uh, just wait for them to call your, your, uh, the last three numbers of your phone number and uh, you'll be limited to three minutes and I'll have to cut you off, unfortunately, if you go longer than that. And um, that, that's pretty much it. We'll get there shortly. All right, uh, can we have a motion to approve the September 8th, 2020 regular session minutes, please? So moved. So moved. Second. Uh, all right, it's been moved, I think, by Council Member Idago Ferring. It was seconded by Dr. Waters. Let's have a vote. If there's no changes, discussion, or input. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, say, opposed say nay. All right, the motion to approve the September 8, 2020 minutes passes unanimously. All right, agenda revisions and submission of documents and or motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items to future agendas. Anyone have anything at this time? Sweet, minor miracle. All right, update on COVID-19, Harold. We still alive? You're on mute, Harold. No, Harold, now, now, Harold. No, go ahead, uh, sorry. I'm having computer, okay, there we go. Um, yes, Mayor, Council, I do actually have um, a couple of things to, to go over regarding um, COVID, and I actually have a few things to go over tonight. Um, I'm gonna start off with um, the, here we go. I'm going to start off with the um, the dial that the um, that the state has put up. So I'm going to share my screen on this one at first, uh, <clears throat> and then from there we'll go to information that the county has uh, provided us. So if you look at the dial, I'll click on Boulder County, um, and then it'll it'll bring up where we are. A couple of things that I want to point out on this is so. If you see, um, in terms of the two-week cumulative increase in cases, you can see that we've all we've gone into the um, pink category, which is equivalent to this one. But if you look at the average positivity and declining or stable stable hospitalizations in Boulder County, you can see that we're actually in in, in the green category here. And so those are two important things. Um, to, to keep in mind as we're going over the data. They look at a number of components when they talk about where you fit on the dial. It's really not just the number of cases that you have in play. Um, that is also very important in working, um, talking to Jeff Zayak today, we've had a number of questions regarding what's happening with the University of Colorado um, and what that means for Longmont Council has um, also talked about um, questions about what does that mean in terms of where we're moving um, in terms of safer at home. And so um, Jeff and I had a chance to talk today. Um, he, he would love to have been here today, but he has, he's not able to based on conversations that they're having regarding this very topic. Um, I want to make sure that you all can see the slideshow that says School District COVID-19 Indicator Framework. Um, Jeff provided me with this um, slideshow and we went over a couple of things that I'm going to speak to. I'm then uh, going to transition into their website um, to go over the data and also show the community where they can go to get some of these graphs. 
The first graph that I want to talk about, and, and you're going to see this twice tonight, is um, they have actually been collecting the data in terms of what's happening within Boulder County as it relates to um, the CU students and staff versus all other cases um, with, within Boulder County. Um, and in talking to Jeff, one of the things that when you see the dark blue, which is all of their cases, you see 28, 20, 18, 23, when you really look at the life of COVID-19 in Boulder County, um, that is still within the range that they're comfortable with and consistent in terms of what we've seen over time in this. What isn't consistent is obviously the increased cases that we've seen within the student population uh, the student and staff population at the University of Colorado. One of the things that he did want me to talk about is um, really when you look at what's occurring in the numbers, they're treating this actually as an outbreak. Um, and the reason they're treating it as an outbreak is that it's um, geographically a very narrow area. Um, and, and when they see it, they're seeing it at the University on the Hill. And most importantly, what they're, what they're seeing when they look at the data is that they're not seeing the number of cases from the student population spreading into the general population of Boulder County. And, and that's a critical point to remember when, when we're talking about their, their data and what they're trying to do. If you look at this graph, this is really um, showing us something that's really important, um, really important as I was discussing it with Jeff. So when you look at the 30 plus category, um, relatively flat in terms of what we've been seeing, 23 to 29, you can see the blue line and it's re remaining relatively stable. Zero to nine and 10 to 17, you're seeing a, a similar move in terms of what's been happening recently. You look at 18 and 19, 18 to 19 and 18 to 22, and you're seeing those very steep curves that we talked about before in terms of where those cases are growing. And so that that obviously is again, you know, pointing to what they're they're dealing with at the university. Um, this slide um, it has broken it down into people who are associated with CU and people who are not associated with CU. So if you look at the 18 to 19 not associated with CU and 18 to 22 not associated with CU, again, their, their curve is pretty flat. There is a slight increase, um, but not in terms of what we're seeing in the data. When you look at those associated with CU, you're seeing that same steep curve that, that we saw on the previous slide. So once again, as, you're, as they're working through the data and really understanding what the impact is, uh, what the potential impact is to, to the county, they're not seeing that community spread if it's not associated with the university. Um, this slide you will see again, um, and this is really the positivity uh, rate that you can see. You can see at this point where we were at 1.7. Um, right now, I think we're um, at a previous version, we were at 4.1. It may be a little bit higher as the slides updated. Um, but again, we're watching that as it moves through it. What's important to see when we're looking at what's happening in Boulder County, if you remember me talking about, they look at the number of cases, but they also look at the number of hospitalizations. Um, all of these variables come in to determine where we are. Boulder County, we're at a 62.5% hospitalization rate. The state average is 129.3 and the national is at 170.4. So we're really in, in good shape when it comes to hospitalizations. A lot of times I also get the question, how many people do we have hospitalized in Longmont right now with COVID? Um, based on what I heard this morning from Dan Eamon, we, we had uh, zero patients in our local hospitals um, with COVID. So again, that's all information that we have to take into account. Um, this graph really shows the hospitalizations um, starting in April. Um, and where we are today. So again, um, you saw a peak um, in August, went down relatively level. Um, and, and so that's continuing to move in a positive way. And then also what's really important that Jeff and I talked about when we look at um, what's happening within the university and what that really means to, to our community. Um, and, and this is really goes out to the residents of our community in terms of 
um, the effort that they're doing in terms of wearing masks. If you look at Longmont, they uh, surveyed eight locations, um, 522 individuals, and 98% of the people were observed wearing masks. Um, if you can see, we're only second to Erie, and we're a much larger community. So all of that comes into play as they're evaluating where we are in, in, in terms of safer at home and, and as we're moving through the process. I'm going to stop sharing this screen. Then I'm going to get out of this one, and I'm going to open up the website to once again just show you all what's happening. Um, on the website in terms of the data. So we have um, 3,963 positive cases. Um, you can see uh, the increase in the cases that were associated with the university. Um, once again, you're seeing this slide to, that really represents that information. And, and then when we get into the testing, what's, uh, what I really wanted to cover with this is again, you see that 4.1%. And where that really starts moving through is on this chart. Um, so one of the questions that I had today was, well, we're seeing a lot of cases. We are. But what you really have to watch is also the positivity rate. Because if you look here, when you see the um, positive cases on the last couple of days, and the data on Jeff slides was from yesterday. This data has been updated, but you can see in the date, this is from um, 17th or 18th, somewhere in that range. Um, when you see that growth in cases, what's also important is they almost um, conducted 1,200 tests. So when you conduct 1,200 tests, you're obviously going to see more cases. But in terms of the positivity rate, we're still below 5%. Um, so that's an important piece um, as folks ask questions. Uh, the positivity rate is as a, is probably more important to watch than just the number of cases. Um, and I know we talked about 500 being the magic number in terms of tests that you wanted that they wanted to perform. You can obviously see that we exceeded 600 tests per day on a number of occasions. When you're starting to look in in this world, um, they opened up two locations in Boulder. Uh, one was on the hill, and that's a walk-up testing location. And, and talking to Jeff, um, Jeff is working both with um, the governor's office and CDPHE as they're having this conversation. They wanted a testing location close to the student population where they could walk up and get tested. Um, and the other one, the other testing location, I forgot the name of that location. Stasio. Stasio Field. So that's the other one where they can... Um, where they can go and get tested. So they're really putting a concerted effort to test the student population so they can see what's happening. Um, when, we, when we look at transmission source, um, you're, you, I wanted to go in the numbers a little bit. So you can see here again, what we're seeing within the community. Um, this chart hasn't been updated. Again, you saw the increase in the five-day average. Um, but this is where you're seeing it, it again. Um, 852 in Longmont, 1,930 in Boulder. Um, and then when you look at it based on where they um, base it on 100,000 population, so you can see how we're doing. You know, once again, we're pretty close again, had a question about how are we compared to Louisville. And Lafayette, you know, we're still in, in that range with those other communities. Um, so as we continue to move through, one of the things that we're also seeing, you remember this was getting higher. We're now at 31.2% in the Latin X population. Again, that doesn't surprise me when you look at the student population generating the majority of cases. And um, in terms of long-term care, you can see some occasional hits, but for the most part, it really doesn't look like it did at the beginning. And that's really good because that's what tends to stress the medical system out. Um, the hospital status on this webpage um, is something happened, um, but earlier everything was in yellow. And um, when you look at med surge beds, you know, it had been in the red earlier. It was in the, the yellow at this point, which really makes sense when you, when you hear how many people were hospitalized, that we didn't have any in Longmont. And you can definitely see 
um, that improving. So um, as we talk about this again, um, I wanna reiter reiterate a couple of points. Um, I know I've had questions about, do, or am I hearing about any change in our status at Safer at Home? What I can say is I'm not hearing about that. That's related to the fact that they are treating this as a very specific and focused outbreak that's occurring within a narrow geographic area within a narrow population band. They are not seeing at this point, and, and everything I'm saying is preferenced with as of today and at this point, um, but they are not seeing um, the spread of cases really outside of that environment. Um, and again, Jeff wanted me to reiterate that um, he wished he could be here today, but um, he is working with the university and the state and others in terms of evaluating the situation. Um, are there any questions regarding the data that I can answer? Uh, Councilmember Douglas Faring. I was gonna let council member Peck go first, but you know, I had a question around the um, reporting. So when people report, so a couple of questions, actually one was around um, when people see, you know, we, we saw that percentage of mass usage on the, mm. uh, the, there was a slide, I don't think you shared it tonight, but I've seen it before, where in the parks or outside, you see um, lower compliance or lower mm -hmm. number of people utilizing masks. And I think there's kind of a, a misunderstanding. We had a conversation around this as well, around people, you know, what happens, what constitute a, a person to have to wear a mask in a public open space as opposed to not, does that make sense? Yeah, so there's actually, there's actually two masking orders that's in play. One is the governor's order on masking, which says that if you're inside, you have to wear a mask at all times. Um, the, the governor's order doesn't really relate, doesn't touch on masking outside, uh, outside. So in that case, we have the Boulder County masking order in play, which states that if you are unable to socially distance from others um, six feet, then you need to wear a mask. Um, but the example that I gave you um, is that if I'm out with my son, because we're in the same household, we can be within six feet because we're in, the, in that household. Um, you'll also hear pods or um, quarantine buddies that are in play and, and things like that. So that's a, a different situation. Um, so there are different um, regulations related to masking. The other thing that comes into play is, you, you know, a question I, I often get is so, if one of my kids were playing, if they were playing softball, do I have to wear a mask? Well, if I'm sitting with my family, um, I don't have to wear a mask because we're again in that cohort. Um, as long as I'm six feet away from another family or another cohort that's in that process. And, and so that's a lot of times the differences that you see in this. Um, I think the thing that we also have to be really cautious of is, is really understanding the broader definition of family in many cases. You've heard us talk about this throughout COVID that early on we were seeing um, a number of cases in multi-generational households. So households also look different. And um, the example I would give you, it could be um, a possibility that let's say if my mom and aunt lived here, um, you know, on the surface, it wouldn't look like we're from the same household, but the reality is that we are. And so that's something else that we have to keep in mind. And then the next question I had was around when people are reporting um, instances where there's non-compliancy. I guess just kind of walk us through the process. What does that look like? Um, comments that I've heard from constituents, colleagues, uh, is that they felt like there was no follow-up. And I'm wondering, and I'm wondering if some of it has to do with maybe if people are are um, filing a complaint anonymously, you can't, you know, they won't be able to find that person to follow up with them. But I was just wondering what what the process is. So, so I'll speak to the process in terms of the follow up. I think you are correct, and it depends on how that complaint comes in, whether and someone wants to wishes to remain anonymous. But generally, what happens? those complaints go into Boulder County Health. Um, now I can say 
um, we've even had calls on things that we have within our system. And um, so they've called us and they said, here's a complaint, here's what we're looking at. Um, we have to respond, we have to tell them um, what the situation was. What, and, and so they dive into it to see what was going on and then they monitor it. I was actually, um, one of the locations was one of our golf courses. Um, and I was actually out there when they were doing a follow-up call. So I know as um, a manager of a facility, we've received those calls. Um, and again, that's one of those interesting dilemmas because um, the golf course has to operate in one person per cart unless you're in the same household. And so a lot of times, or that family structure, a lot of times it can look like they shouldn't be, but they are. Um, and, and so we do ask people if what category they fall into as we're moving through that. Um, on the other side of it, we know that they do, um, you all were made aware of the situation with magic fairy candles and I see Eugene getting ready to jump on. Um, they um, notified us about, they received a complaint. They began interacting with that business um, and they eventually had to take legal action to deal with that. So, um, I know that they're also having those conversations with the private businesses in our community. The one thing that I can't speak to is whether or not people leave their information. I think the other thing people, uh, I think we all need to be cognizant of this is when you look at this and you look at the number of people that it takes to do the contact tracing, the number of people that it takes to process these claims, um, you know, they're constantly coming in. So I don't know what their availability is to even respond back to the group, but that's probably a question that I can push that to Jeff and see what their processes are. Councilor Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, I have two questions for you, Harold. One of them is similar to what uh, Councilwoman Hidalgo Firing was saying, and I was just curious if you have had any complaints about uh, little leagues and soccer players who are, are they wearing masks on benches when they're in the dugouts? And, and um, I've had some questions about that from residents. So I was wondering if, if those are some of the types of complaints that you're getting as well. Um, I have not had any of those come to my attention. Um, I will tell you when the leagues have their operational plans, um, they, the leagues and Jeff's on tonight for another item, but the leagues have to get their, they work with the Boulder County Health Department in terms of getting their plans approved. Okay. Um, what I can tell you, the only thing that I have heard with regard to youth sports and playing is actually the opposite side of it. And, and it's been from the players where they have gone to other counties and have participated in youth sports and they have not been required to wear masks, but they are required to, required to wear masks here in Boulder County. Um, and the questions I've received have actually been regarding that. Why, why do they have to wear them here when they don't have to wear them when they're playing in County X or City X? Um, but again, um, I, I do know that they're following up on that. So I would encourage, if someone has concerns, they need to let them know. Um, I can say that um, we have had situations with leagues that haven't necessarily um, operated appropriately in other communities. And so when they come here, that is in our mind in terms of how we move forward with those, with those situations. So we're being mindful of it. And we are working collectively as municipalities in terms of what our experience is with various groups. Okay, thank you. Uh, my second question is, we got an update from Governor Polis's uh, conference this afternoon about the American Indian population being over, overly, being more infected or, I, I didn't see on your charts that we had any kind of a measurement for our, the American Indians. I did see the category, but I didn't see a measurement. So could you kind of let us know what you know about um, the state population uh, of American Indians, are they being overly affected? Um, so the native populations are being disproportionately affected by the virus um, and the state is working with those organizations to address it. Um, so, 
they're really working in that arena, CDPHE, with, with, the, with the various organizations. I think where they're seeing it, um, maybe on, more on, um, you know, we saw this in, in Arizona early on in, in north, northwest New Mexico in the, in the reservation setting. I know they were seeing it. So I think, um, I can't speak to that in detail, but based on what I was briefed on earlier today, I think that's where they're really focusing because that's where they're seeing uh, the growth. But We don't um, have anything measurable in our county for American Indians. Uh, no, it's like 0.3%. Um, I'm trying to see. Um, COVID cases is, it's less than a percent in Boulder County. Perfect. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, the next thing I would like to go over with you, I'm gonna introduce Peter uh, Gibbons. Um, this is what I talked to you all about last week in that we were putting together um, and, and trying to take guidance in terms of CARES funding and CDBG-CV funding. Um, we're gonna go over that with you all today. Um, would, uh, and then um, it, when we get to the end of the presentation, um, we're gonna open it up for questions, but. We're at the point now where we need to move with some pace because of the spending deadlines on some of it. So Susan, if you will go ahead and start bringing Peter's presentation up, you will, um, Peter will start it. You will see me jump in on a couple of points within the presentation. Um, Peter? All right, thanks Harold. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay, thanks, Harold. Uh, good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Uh, I am Peter Gibbons. I'm the Recovery Manager and Emergency Management Coordinator for the City. Uh, the purpose of my presentation tonight is to brief you on our recovery funding budget from two funding sources, uh, the, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, or CVRF for short, and HUD's CDBG and CDBG CV funding, all of which were provided by the CARES Act. Um, I will cover amounts available, some of the rules for spending, and how we aim to spend this fund toward um, our recovery needs in our community. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, CVRF uh, is funding provided to the states from the CARES Act. In our case, the Department of Local Affairs, uh, or DOLA, is the primary administrator. Uh, Boulder County is our local primary recipient, and Longmont is a sub-recipient for this funding. Uh, next slide, please. So Longmont received two allocations of CBRF totaling $4.3 million. Uh, this was determined on a per capita basis and Boulder County provided uh, one allocation and Weld County provided the, under, uh, the other allocation due to Longmont residents living within the Weld County jurisdiction. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Coronavirus Relief Fund rules are flexible but require careful navigation to ensure long-term funding retention uh, through the eventual audit by the Office of Inspector General or OIG. Um, there are three primary rules for spending in a web of eligibility language um, that we are navigating to spend this funding completely and safely. Uh, next slide, please. So the three primary rules include all expenses being necessary and directly due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, they cannot have been budgeted for in the adopted 2020 budget and all expenses must have been incurred between March 1st and December 30th of this year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, CVRF's additional rules for spending include costs incurred to comply with public health orders, uh, supporting vulnerable populations, provision of economic support to local businesses, any activities related to protection of public health um, in public facilities, some payroll expenses related to response and recovery are eligible, and other activities that support the functioning of local governments through this event. Next slide, please. Um, unfortunately, the Coronavirus Relief Fund cannot be, used to fund uh, cannot be used to fund revenue shortfalls or replacements for local governments, um, as in we cannot use it to fill uh, budget caps in bulk. Next slide, please. Um, as is common to see in disaster recoveries, we've established uh, four primary categories to serve uh, in the recovery uh, from this event. Uh, the first is individual assistance or uh, IA, as I will uh, show in future slides, um, business assistance, partner assistance, and the city organization recovery. And this framework is just a simple diagram of that information. Next slide, please. 
So moving into the coronavirus fund recovery spending plan section, um, we're applying a basic theory of spending to expend this fund safely and completely. Uh, we aim to spend the, to apply the funding um, to clearly eligible activities, so we ensure the funding stays in Longmont. Uh, additionally, we aim to provide as much of it as possible to support the community as we balance the spending budget across all recovery categories. Um, we aim to remove barriers to access and create adaptations whenever possible, and we aim to spend all funding by the deadline, which is the end of this year. Next slide. Uh, looking at a mid-level view of recovery spending, the table shown includes actual amounts already spent on response and recovery activities, items we know exist in the organization and community, um, and unmet needs across all recovery categories. Uh, in breaking the list of expenses and needs into categories, Harold and I noticed that the split across recovery categories happened to land very evenly across all. Next slide. So if we can back up real quick, Peter. Um, sure. A couple of things, you, you obviously see telework in this. Um, that's a big piece. I, wanted, I do wanna go over the numbers. Um, so you can see that we put 170,000 there. Our, our cost associated with the event, um, digital divide, I think what's important is the 1.1 million for the business assistance grant. Um, I do wanna point out the restaurant voucher program. So there's 20,000 there, 10 to, to refund what council used for the first program, but another 10,000 to um, create another round in the restaurant voucher program. The LDDA Bigger Hard Stronger Streets Initiative, that's really the work that we did um, downtown and the cost associated with that. Um, we did talk about um, last week, childcare being an important component of that. Um, we have 705,000. Um, the utility billing assistance, um, so that's really what we know in terms of what people need at this point in terms of managing the, their, their utility bills. Um, and then you can see housing services support of 126,000 and then 254,000 moving into our health and human service agency funding to help support those organizations. Um, what I wanna say is this is just the CVRF piece. Um, we also have another piece coming in that I will talk about. So what we were trying to do is balance both funding sources to have as wide an impact as we could have in our community and really hit all of those needs. Um, and we were really going at what are the rules and what we can spend, what are the needs. Um, and what was interesting is when you see the next slide, um, so when you approach it from rules and needs, this is where we ended up. And so we were actually pretty close from a percentage basis across all four of the categories. Um, our, the top three, you can obviously see the partner assistance is lower. Sorry, go ahead, Peter. Oh, no, you're good. So um, I think what that leads us to is um, basically just to summarize, we're, you know, the, we put these categories together so that we can make sure that we were bolstering each of those recovery categories throughout our community. Um, I think I'm ready for the next slide. Um, there you go. So All right. this, is, this is my slide now. Mm -hmm. So as you will remember, we came in on the front end of this and we, we repurposed CDBG funds. We then had the CV funding come into the organization and then we had another round of CV funding hit us. And so as Peter was working on the CARES piece, we were then trying to understand what we needed to do with the CV funding. Now, one of the key components of the CV funding is that you actually have more time to spend it than you do on the CARES funding. So we're gonna have to balance that piece out. But when you look at the CDBG world, um, they do give you 20% um, administration costs. That is because the requirements associated with this program there are a lot of requirements in the CARES funding program, but the requirements associated with the CDBG piece, they're, they're more stringent. And so it takes more work to get that done. We have then also um, put in out of that CDBG CV funding, uh, 657,000 for individual housing assistance. And so that individual housing assistance is actually rent assistance, mortgage assistance, we also then have to look at the 400,000 that we have for utility assistance in play. So I know we talked about some other items regarding rent and mortgages. Um, 
we weren't really sure what we could, how we could pull these fundings, but we actually have a funding source that is dedicated for that within our community. Um, you'll see a common, uh, the Coronavirus Recovery Center, that's a common component with, between this and the CARES funding. I think we had 30,000 in CARES, 70,000 in this level. Um, there is a chance based on some other funding that this may free up. And so we'll have to figure that out as well. And then you also see the Aspen Meadow rehab relocation piece. So that is obviously a housing authority project. But one of the things that happened based on the timing of that rehab project is because of COVID, there were more restrictions in play in terms of how we had to go in and actually uh, move through the construction process. And those restrictions um, accounted for in an, an additional $150,000 in cost for that project. So we're also recommending that out of the CDBGCV funding, it goes to, it goes to supplement um, the rehab of Aspen Meadows. In total, we're bringing in 1,096,000 in, in this area. Next slide, sorry, Peter. So um, when you combine the, um, or when you look at the CDBG CV allocation, you can see 60% of that funding is going into individual assistance, 20% into partner. That's actually with the housing authority and then 20% going into the city organization and that's the administrative costs associated um, under HUD rules. Next slide, I think this one's yours, Peter. Yep, that can be mine. Uh, so when we combine these funding sources and across uh, and sort across the different funding uh, recovery categories, you can see similar distributions of funding across each of the categories of recovery. So it retained that integrity of how we distributed uh, the funding across each each of those uh, across each of those funds. Um, next slide, please. So the next steps in our recovery include continuing to evaluate unmet needs in the community and the organization and to ensure eligibility by following all funding guidelines. Um, since these funding sources are tied directly to the COVID-19 pandemic, all recovery expenses need to also be tied to the pandemic response and recovery. Um, we will prepare documentation for the eventual Office of Inspector General audit, uh, and we will continue working with the city's partners on business and individual assistance options. Um, finally, we will continue seeking um, funding options for the 2021 uh, year and our long-term recovery goals. Um, next slide, please. please. Um, and I believe that concludes our presentation. Um, my name is Peter Gibbons. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. Thanks, Peter. So, or, but, yes, Dr. Waters. Uh, do we get to ask questions now, or we would you would Peter or Harold prefer we follow up? I'm I'm good. Um, go go ask the question now, Doc. Uh, I, so I get this has to be spent by the end of the year. I also saw the seven hundred and five thousand dollars for childcare. Um, give me give me what share with us. Would you what you how you thought that money would be best spent by the end of the year. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm curious, are any of our child care providers aware of the fact that there's gonna be $705,000 available? So there were, there were conversations trying to establish what, so we did a survey to understand what the needs were within the child care providers um, and we were moving through it. Um, so, so we were basing our decision on that, on different data sources. Um, I think there's, there's two things that we're looking at. First and foremost is um, a scholarship fund for families who need childcare, who can't afford to pay childcare, where they would come into our system. That is a very clear use of the funds under, under the process. Um, and, and Peter ranked it five to one, and that's like a four or five. I think the other component will be to balance that versus what we need within the the child care centers, we've obviously been providing them some support as we're moving through the process. So first and foremost, scholarships, and then the next level is, are, are there needs that we can fold into this amount? So um, families could basically uh, bank uh, time for a child in a child care center by receiving a, a, a stipend or a grant uh, that they could then move over to, the, to a center. Would, that would be one approach. 
Correct, and ideally the way we would want to do that, um, and this is going to be a little bit different in two categories. So in terms of childcare, because of the rules and because of the clawback provisions that are associated with, with all of these rules, we're going to be very, we're, we're going to be managing these programs because the clawback comes to us. So we're working on, this is why we wanted to have this conversation today so we can finish up that process so we can immediately get the funds out on the street. Something that's a little bit different when you look at business assistance grants because of the restrictions on the funds and again clawback um, versus us going to another organization, we're going to manage that as our organization because of um, we need to have Peter lockstep with that program really working through what we do. That makes sense. I just I know there's going to be a keen interest on the part of lots of people on um, being able to make the highest and best use of that amount of money between now and the end of the year to provide as much service as we can into 2021, uh, some of which I assume might include um, uh, helping to cover expenses where providers are up against it in terms of being able to maintain space, acquire PPE, the kinds of, uh, the con kinds of materials that, that they had not otherwise budgeted for this year and are gonna be pushed to budget for it in 2021. Would those those are the examples of things that they might be thinking about? Could be, and I know we've we've put some money into PPE for childcare um, yeah. already, and um, so it, it would be that. The other thing that's in play that um, we we also need to touch on because of the deadline. If we see things that are all of a sudden falling into an ineligible criteria or they can't be spent, they can't be spent, then we're going to have to sweep them into categories that can be spent very quickly. And, and this may be one of those categories or health and human service funding may be one of those categories in terms of the sweeping process. Yeah, well, I hope you get a bunch of questions after tonight from our childcare providers and, and parents mm -hmm. um, desperately need this kind of support for a seriously underfunded enterprise that's fundamental to our economic recovery. So good on you uh, for yeah. making that a high priority. Um, I'm glad you were listening to lots of input, so thanks. Uh, Councilor Martin. Mayor Bagley, um, it wasn't clear to me whether the distribution plans for these funds and uh, as Dr. Waters has been saying, especially the child care, um, whether the distribution plans are all mostly in place and some new distribution plans have to be made or whether this is money that doesn't have an avenue out of the city's funds yet. So they've been working and looking at what that distribution plan will look like. We've had to work within the rules to understand what it, what it can be used for and how we can use it. We wanted to take the numbers and the recommendations we're making to council tonight. And if council says we like where you're going, then we will begin that implementation process. So there's some fine tuning. They have, they have to work more on it to get those funds out on the street. And is this what we have to go on that you've just finished presenting or are, is there gonna be subsequent information later tonight that, that uh, breaks down some of these funds a little farther in terms of what goes where? Um, this is the presentation based on what we have today. If you have specific questions about where they go, I can, we can pull that, that presentation up and go into it. So in terms of um, the, the city funds, what you're gonna see there is telework. You're going to see um, uh, pandemic response funds. Uh, so related to where we had people that we had to send home and weren't working, but we were paying. Um, trying to think what else we had. Um, our direct expenses associated with plexiglass, PPE, those types of things, that's in the city's, that's in the city component. I don't know if there's a specific question I can answer or what we can bring back to you all. I was thinking more in terms of the child care and also the utilities and rental assistance. So the utility plan is in place. So we are working with our center um, and we have a plan in place that as that is being implemented as we speak. Um, because the our center received $100,000 from the state for utility assistance. 
And so our plan would be on utility assistance to just piggyback on that program and continue working our residents through that program. On the childcare piece, that's going to take some more work and we can update council in terms of where we are. So in the um, utility assistance, that means that they've already got a distribution path. Yes. We'll just funnel more money into it and it goes out their path. Correct, and then on the rental assistance, mortgage assistance path, we have that built within our, our system in terms of how we work with people in that world, uh, in, in Kathy Fedler and Karen's world in terms of our CDBG program. So, so that's a no. And things that are we're still working on embedded in the city's cost is our digital divide program. Um, and there's some nuances we have to pull together on that piece. Um, and then the childcare piece obviously is going to take a little bit more work um, we didn't want to get too far down the road and, and, and get a different direction. On the business assistance side, council directed um, business assistance dollars out of the CDBG fund early on in that process. And so uh, Molly O'Donnell and Aaron Fosdek had built something based on the CDBG funds. Because we got the, the amount of money we did in CARES, we're just going to uh, our, uh, adapt their process because it had a lot more requirements in it. So we're gonna um, reframe their worksheet um, and then put that money out. Um, so that process is further along in terms of development. Thank you. So uh, uh, Council, I almost called it. Sister Peck, no, Councilor Peck. No idea where that one came from. Me either. Um, so thank you, Mayor Bagley. Going back to the childcare funding piece, I also wanna thank you for um, all the work you're doing on this, Harold and Karen and Kathy. Uh, but is that funding also available to licensed daycare homes, homes that are licensed through Boulder County, or is this only for daycare centers? So my thought is, is if somebody needed to go to daycare um, with licensed daycare in that, in that world, they would have to demonstrate why they need the funding and then who they're going to utilize, and then we would take that approach there. One of the challenge actually that we're seeing in home daycare right now that we saw based on the survey and the conversations is that we're, if we're losing spots in one location, that's kind of where we're losing spots um, because, um, because of COVID people aren't necessarily wanting people in their homes. So okay. um, that world is changing pretty quickly in terms of what we, but my idea is if, it, if it's a licensed provider and a home or a building, they let us know and then you know, we work with, with that group because the reason we want them to come to us and then we fund to the group is, is so that we can ensure the chain of the money and that it's paying for the spot so that we don't get caught in a clawback provision. And that clawback provision is 15 year, it's a 15 year window. Oh, okay. Um, with OIG. And, and so that's why you're seeing us being really careful in terms of the categories we're identifying. The one thing I also need to add is on the CDBG portion, we're going to have to come back with a, um, a program amendment mm -hmm. um, to where we moved the funds that were designated for businesses. We moved those into the housing, rental and mortgage assistance and utility assistance world because we have funding available and business assistance on the other side. So we're going to have to come back with the program amendment. They did change the rules, so it's a five-day posting as we can move through that. Okay. But we didn't want to bring that until I presented this to you all. Okay, so is the marketing piece that this funding will be available also uh, being marketed to Boulder County licensing, daycare licensing people? Um, we will work on that. Um, again, we want to work with the residents of our community because where we got for, so a piece in this, the other thing we need to work on is working for our residents um, because every community in Boulder County received funding. And so we're actually yes. going to be marketing to the community um, in this. And that's the other piece that we have to you now very quickly spin on and, and move. Um, they have been working on that as well. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Council Member Christensen. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, Harold, I know that um, the city has been giving daycare providers uh, some of our 
masks and things like that, um, which is wonderful because they have such a need for cleaning things. And um, it was good that we could help them out. Is that part of this funding or is that a separate thing? Peter, I think that's part of this funding, correct? So the wonderful thing is that it can be part of this funding. We're, we're actually um, working with some other potential funding sources to port into that as well. So uh, the, the amount that's written into this particular line for things like PPE and cleaning supplies is really more of a backup plan um, and to just guarantee that we, that we will be able to provide uh, those kinds of materials to daycare providers um, going forward. Yeah, that's wonderful that we can be so flexible because uh, I can't imagine doing daycare or having to deal with it right now. Anyway, thank you for all you're doing, both of you. And so in the, in the well, it's a huge team. So um, I'll pass that on to him. What I will point out, and Peter touched on this, this is CARES and this is CV. CV's in Kathy's world, CARES is in this other world. Yeah. Peter's also aggressively working other grant opportunities um, and, and connecting people with uh, different grant opportunities associated with COVID. COVID. And you, you will see some of those moving through the system. And so he's also supporting um, our organization, but then our partners through this process with coming up with these additional funding sources that he's finding. Um, at this point, um, I really want to, is council okay moving with this process? and the dollars we have allocated, and then we will keep you updated on the processes that we're developing in our public information campaign. Yes. All right, let's go ahead and move on to first call public environment. I've got one more. Harold, no, 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 we moved on. You didn't say it. <laughs> no, 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 this is a different item. Go ahead. One of the things, and this actually is related, we wanted to give you all an update. I have Tyler Stamey here. I know you all have been having a lot of questions regarding the Pike Road project in um, South Hoffman Street. And um, so I've asked Tyler to come in and give you all a brief presentation. So you all, we've sent you uh, some information via email. We wanted to give it to you really quick because we know you all are having questions about what's going on. So it, just, just that, uh, that's right down the street from me. The light is in. There's Correct. zero, there's zero percent chance that light's coming out. And Correct. so let's, let's spend two minutes on this. All right. I'll do my best. Mayor and Council, Tyler Stamey, Transportation Engineering Administrator. Thank you for the opportunity to provide information on South Kaufman tonight. Um, next slide, please. First and foremost, I wanna to touch on South Kaufman itself. It is a local street, it's not a collector. There's no plans and no discussion to change it from a local to a collector. Designation of the street is really determined by the city's comprehensive plan, which to make a change to that requires a, an amendment and a council action to do so. Street classifications that we have, we have locals, collectors, and a couple different versions of arterials. Um, arter classification is really a determination of function. What does it do? Access versus mobility. Local streets really provide more access. Arter arterials are really focused more on providing mobility. So when we look at South Kaufman Street, in the Southmore Park neighborhood. It's a built out neighborhood. It has access for each of the houses that's built along the street. It doesn't have a lot of connectivity. It has connectivity from Pike up to uh, Missouri Street and then down to Plateau. And it, and it appears to really be functioning as a local street as it was intended. Next slide, please. I pulled some historical data we had on this section of roadway. The, old, the oldest data I could find was from 1995. Back in 1995, we had about a little more than 450 cars a day on this section of roadway. We have some additional data points since 1995 and until now, 2012, 2018, 2019. You'll see that it's relatively stayed the same. It hasn't really grown, hasn't gone down, it stayed the same, which is really indicative that it is really functioning as a local street. It's not a collector. It's not providing access to new destinations despite growth that's happened around it and to the south of it, it really hasn't had much of an impact on South Kaufman Street. Um, next slide. Up here, why are we talking about this? The Pike Road project was really the impetus for change and, and why we're doing this. Back in early 2019, we sent letters to each of the households in the highlighted areas. We'll see several different colors. 
on the map here. Those were just for identifying the neighborhoods. And each each household got a letter. They got they were invited to one of two open houses. We had quite a bit of turnout to those open houses, and we heard quite a bit of feedback from what we initially proposed at that open house meeting. Based on that open house, we made a, we went to the drawing board. We made a lot of changes to our proposed project, and we sent a follow up letter after that to the same properties again, and notified of the changes that we were going to make based on the feedback we heard. Primarily, one of the big things is the addition of the traffic signal at Pike and South Kaufman. We also sent a letter in February of 2020 to these same properties again to, to provide information. Hey, the, the project is kicking off this this year. It also does include the traffic signal at the intersection of Pike and South Kaufman. Next slide. So the uh, traffic signal, again, was really impetus from what we heard from the public feedback at our open houses. We needed, we heard very loudly and clearly that we needed to do more at Pike and South Kaufman. Really, this is start, the impetus for this is a safety project. It's, it's a, tied to a safety project at Pike in Maine, which has and continues to be a high crash location. And as that ties in, the, that project there is adding a second northbound left turn lane to get that large volume of northbound left traffic through the intersection. And when we look at this intersection, this will provide the safest, um, the safest improvement for this intersection based on the information we have. We checked it against warrants in the manual and uniform traffic control devices that did meet warrants. And I also want to talk about signal spacing. So our, in, a, in a vacuum, if we were dividing or designing a new city with perfectly designed arterials optimized for traffic flow, we'd be looking at spacing of our traffic signals on a grid, half mile spacing. That's really where you get your best progression on, a, on an arterial system. When we look at the interaction of these two particular intersections and why we're comfortable with the location of this signal, is really the traffic patterns we see here. The northbound left from Pike and Main is the big movement in the morning. And so that can be progressed with the westbound through at Pike and Kaufman. Alternately in the PM, we see the big movement is the eastbound traffic coming the other way back to Main Street. And that's primarily eastbound right turns at Main Street. So those two, those two movements really aren't, aren't going to be conflicting with each other and they don't really need to be progressed. So when we talk about the signal spacing, the half mile being preferred for arterial design. When we look at this particular system, the interaction of these two intersections, we're, we're comfortable that this is the best solution for these two intersections and how they'll work together. Next slide, please. We, we've met with, I've talked with several of the residents on South Kaufman in the past. One of the things that we've I've directed them to is we have a neighborhood traffic mitigation program for dealing with traffic on neighborhood streets. One of the criteria in that program says in order for physical devices, which would be your speed tables, permanent radar signs, we're looking for a minimum daily traffic volume of 750 cars a day. Now, if you remember that slide from earlier, we're seeing about 500. So we're below that threshold. So it, historically, this street has not been eligible for that type of physical mitigation. I also met with a handful of neighbors on South Kaufman Street at one of their homes on, I think it was June 10th this summer, we met and talked about history of South Kaufman Street, discussions we'd had in the past and how, they, how we can work with them to move forward. One of the options is they need to submit an application. We have, a, it's a relatively straightforward application. We require five signatures, quick description of the problem. They turn it in and we can move forward. We also said one of the things that they can ask for is an exception to that 750 vehicle threshold. Hey, look, we've got, we understand that there's some changes here. There's a signal going in, a large project that could be justification to support that potentially. Uh, the person that, or the position that has for the policy, the person that can make that decision on the waiver is the director of engineering services, has the ability to, to make that decision to waive the 750 requirement. And to date, we've not received that application. We provided it both physical copies to many of the residents that were in attendance. And we've also emailed uh, PDF versions and, and asked for them to, to sign those, turn them back in and we can get moving. And that's all I have for tonight. You know, I'm trying to keep it as quick as I could for you. And uh, all right. you have any. Thanks, Tyler. You're awesome. Appreciate it. All right. Um, let's go ahead now. Take a two-minute break, or actually three or four-minute break, to uh, get uh, people in line for public invited to be heard. So just call that number right there on your screen and wait patiently, and we'll call you into the room. You got three minutes. Thank you. Back soon.
All right, folks, welcome to all the callers that we have tonight. Please make sure that you have muted the live stream and that you're listening through your telephone for directions. We will be unmuting you one at a time when we uh, come back into the meeting. We will call on you based on the last three digits of your phone number. So again, please mute the live stream so that you can hear who we're calling on. Thank you. Hi folks, welcome. I've let a bunch of folks in to join the meeting. As we return, we will be calling on you one at a time. Please make sure you've muted the live stream so that you can hear the instructions and you can hear when I call on you. When we do, we will ask you to unmute and we'll call out the last three digits of your phone number. Hi folks, once again, for the callers that have just joined us, we will be getting uh, started here shortly. 
please make sure that you've muted the live stream that you were watching previously and listen to the messages and instructions through the phone. We will call on you one at a time and ask you to unmute by calling out the last three digits of your phone number. All right, council member, can I have the uh, screen back so I can see who's here? Two of us, the rest of us, there they are. Me. And Aaron, there we are. All right, let's go ahead and start calling in. How many are on the list? Uh, we have quite a few, Mayor. Okay, how many? Uh, last I counted was over 10, maybe 15, something yeah. in that. I cool. can count. Well, let's start it. All right. Our first caller, your phone number ends in 984. 984, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Would you please state your name and address for the record? And you have three minutes. 984. I'm going to move on to the next caller. Caller 125, I'm going to ask you to unmute 125. There you are. Hi there. This, yes, can you hear me? We can. You may begin. Okay, great. Hey, Mayor Bagley, council and staff, this is Shannon Fender, Director of Public Affairs with Native Roots Cannabis. Um, and I am also permitted to speak tonight on behalf of Sarah Woodson who is the executive director for the Color of Cannabis. Um, and the, they ran the social equity legislation at the state this spring. The Color of Cannabis and other organizations are advocating for opportunities to diversify the cannabis industry ownership through marijuana delivery in jurisdictions across the state. Native Roots has served the Longmont community since 2014. And we serve both patients and adult customers at 19 South Sunset Street which is one of the uh, Boulder County enclaves in Longmont. And I just wanna say thank you. We really do appreciate council's desire to move delivery forward this evening. Um, we do recommend the current draft be amended to reflect the written comments that we submit to council and staff via email. And that includes amending the definition of marijuana delivery business to be a state regulated business. And that will allow for Native Roots to serve the community and for all businesses conducting delivery to use state-regulated transporter services as well. And these recommendations also include removing the body camera requirement, which is excessive and unnecessary for deliveries. The state has provided robust rules governing marijuana delivery, including mandatory ID checking, GPS tracking of vehicles, and video monitoring of product in the vehicle. Currently, you can have food, alcohol, and even prescription pain meds delivered to your house uh, by mail or courier with these requirements, and marijuana delivery is the most secure product to be delivered in the state. Um, and with that, I would encourage you to adopt these amendments on first reading um, and move the, forward, uh, move the ordinance forward tonight. I do appreciate your time and am available to answer any questions. Oh, sorry, next caller. One minute, Mayor. All right, the next caller is 563. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. 563. There you are, can you hear us? Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? We can. Please state your name and, okay. and address for the record. Thanks. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Leah Wilson Valentine. I actually live in Firestone, um, but I am here to speak in support of the resolution to name Swim Beach at Union Reservoir after my father, Fred Wilson. I'd like to take a few moments to talk about what Union Reservoir meant to my dad and why I think we should name the beach in his honor. When I think of the beach at Union, I think of my dad sitting on a picnic bench with his ragged old shorts and sandals waiting for the wind. We talk about happy places a lot these days and I can tell you with absolute certainty that the beach at Union was my dad's happy place. Another thing I can say with absolute certainty is that my dad was the driving force behind what Union Reservoir is today. My family first started going to Union Reservoir in the late 80s when it required a membership. Dad had learned to windsurf on some other lakes in the area, and he was quite possibly the first person to windsurf at Union. When he became mayor, 
He was passionate about making Union a wakeless lake so that he and other windsurfers would have a safe place to pursue their sport. In the years since Union became a part of the city of Longmont, he spent a huge amount of time out there, windsurfing, sailing, kayaking, swimming, and more. He built himself a rowing shell some time ago and rowed that thing around the lake at least 100 times. Right around the time he got tired of rowing, he heard about the crazy new fad in California, stand-up paddling. He repurposed one of his old windsurfers, built himself a stand-up paddle, and set out on the lake, becoming quite possibly the first person ever to stand up paddle on Union. People thought he was crazy. I'm sure that if dementia hadn't got its hold on my dad, he'd still be out at Union these days, pioneering some new sport, reviving an old one, playing with his grandkids, or just having a good time waiting for the wind. Please approve the resolution tonight in honor of my father's service to the city of Longmont and his love for Union Reservoir. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, next caller. Next caller, Mayor, is 722. The last three digits is of your phone number are 722. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Seven two two, can you unmute yourself? There you are. Okay. Hi, my name is Lynette McLean, and um, I am a resident in uh, Longmont. Um, the air quality in Longmont is poor, primarily due to fracking, notwithstanding the recent fires. But this is the fracking is causing our air quality to be poor on a consistent basis. The American Lung Association has given the area an F rating for ozone. Harmful chemicals produced by fracking such as benzene, toluene, carbon dioxide, and ethane often spike late at night when the oil companies are illegally flaring. But these chemicals have also been measured at high levels during the day. And a reminder that there's no known safe level for children for pollutants such as benzene, which is a known carcinogen. While this knowledge could hinder Longmont's reputation, and economic growth and development might be tarnished with this publicity, residents should know what is in their air. Hiding the truth about Longmont's air quality is an irresponsible stance to take. Longmont residents need to know the truth about Longmont's air quality so that they can protect their children, their medically fragile, their medically fragile family members. We need a daily emergency response system warning our residents when the air quality is at dangerous levels. Such a warning system could be done with the current air monitoring at Union Reservoir and is already in place in Bloomfield. The city only has to ask Dr. Helmick to provide us the same warning emails that are being provided in Bloomfield. We also need our city leaders to take a more proactive stance to improve our air quality by engaging in hearings at the Air Quality Con Control Commission and the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Also, Mayor Bagley and David Holmbacher Hornbacher, who are both directors of the Platte Valley Power Authority, need to support the city's climate resolution by voting not to use carbon fuels to electrify Longmont this week. In addition, we need to offer a contract to Dr. Zetlev that allows him to speak to the residents about our dangerous air without having to wait for 48 hours. Thank you. All right, um, next caller. I'm going to go back to caller 984. I'm going to ask you to unmute 984. Hello. Can you hear us? Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? We can. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Brian Ortega. I am my address is 9830. I live in, in uh, sorry, I wasn't, I didn't think I was going to get called again. I live in uh, Denver, Colorado. Um, thank you for holding this meeting and thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm going to get to the point. My name is Brian Ortega. I am uh, currently the Director of Logistics for Sharp Solutions. We are a courier service here in Colorado, focusing in business-to-business -business delivery. 
um, we we're trying to transition in business to consumer, God willing, uh, trying to get patients on medicine. I'm also the former director of Veterans for Natural Rights. Um, but today, today I'm speaking as a, as a patient, 100% um, medically retired combat veteran, um, also a productive member of the state of Colorado, and above all else, I'm a father. Um, what I want to speak on is there's a mental health crisis facing our nation. Um, for quite some time, it, it, it's been uh, the suicide and opioid em epidemic, uh, mostly facing our veterans. Uh, I believe delivery uh, will provide desperately needed access for a struggling community. I'm a 100% medically retired combat veteran and a cannabis refugee from the state of Texas. Like a majority of our veterans, um, I came back from war with a lot of issues that I didn't leave with. Uh, mental health issues, chronic pain, I had multiple brain injuries, um, degenerative and flip disc in my lower lumbar and upper spine. Um, I was given a cocktail of prescriptions. Um, they just caused more problems. I was given lithium. I had to have my blood checked once a week so they, they could make sure, the government could make sure my levels weren't toxic. Uh, they maxed me out on psychotropic medications, pain meds, um, and all the plethora that comes with trying to fix what the ailments those cause. Um, cannabis saved my life. The great state of Colorado afforded me access to this medicine that replaced over 10 prescriptions for me. Cannabis opened me up to receiving help. I became more active, enrolled in therapy, uh, both physical and mental. Then I, I went to college. I got into engineering at CU Boulder. The, the government told me I had a 40% uh, global function rating out of 100, that I was going to be on the couch for the rest of my life. I was using a walker for the better point of uh, 2009. When I got here, luckily, I had a spouse that was able to go get me my meds. Um, majority of the veterans that I've met in my advocacy and activism don't have that luxury. A lot of us have mobility barriers. Um, a number of us have reasons um, to include mental health that keep us from access, uh, even though they live here in Colorado. I believe opening up home delivery will not only improve the quality of life for so many, but save the lives of so many more. Um, I'd like to end here with a couple of uh, statistics from the Disabled American Veterans website that the FDA notes considerable interest as well as uh, clinical research that supports that interest in treating medical conditions to include but not limited to glau glaucoma, uh, multiple sclerosis, um, chemotherapy-induced nausea. Oh, I'm sorry, we're not to cut you off because we're, we're well over three minutes, but I do appreciate your comments and coming in today, okay? Thank you. All right, next caller. Mayor, the next caller, your phone number ends in 949. I'm going to ask you to unmute 949. There you are. Hi, this Hi. is Ruby Bowman, 1512 Love Tan Drive. Mayor Bagley and council members, why does the city of Longmont need to hire an environmental planner? A couple of good reasons are, one, the planner will ensure that developers who are looking to build in Longmont have a good understanding of what is required for code compliance. And two, the planner will also ensure that developers are aware of the city's important wildlife and natural resources that need protection. We are blessed to have habitat in the city that is of state significance. We have the St. Brain Creek a one-of-a-kind transition stream running through our town. A CPW biologist stated in a letter to the city that the city reach of the St. Brain has immense aquatic conservation value to the state of Colorado because of the rare native fish inhabiting the, the stream. Boulder County reiterated this fact in its scoping comments for RSVP. We have eagle habitat in our riparian areas, including an important winter roost, and we also have Union Reservoir. Audubon has stated in the past that the wetlands, the riparian woodlands, and the grasslands surrounding Union Reservoir comprise one of the most productive habitats for nesting and migratory birds in eastern Colorado. In 2003, 107 or more eagles were recorded at the 
at the reservoir when there was a shad die-off. Some reported the number as high as 150. This sighting was documented in the old wildlife management plan. An Audubon representative reported that people from all over the, over the, from all over the state came to Longmont to catch a glimpse of this amazing occurrence. We need a planner with an educational background and experience to focus on wildlife and sustainability issues during the development process, especially during these times of dire environmental changes due to climate change. The environmental planner position was approved by council in the 2020 budget. It is in the proposed 2021 budget. It is important for our community and native species that the city releases and fills this position as soon as possible. We also need more park rangers in 2021 to patrol our greenways, parks, and open space. Thank you. All right, the next caller is caller that ends in 323. 323, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. And then next up is 060. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley and council members. Jamie Simo, 525 East 16th Avenue. On September 8th, city council approved several revisions to the municipal code chapters dealing with the protection of streams and creeks wetlands, riparian areas, and habitat and species protection based on comments brought up by Longmont resident Ruby Bowman. In reading through the version of the code presented to council tonight, I don't see those revisions reflected. Will these revisions be added prior to publication? Again, I'd also like to reiterate the need for Longmont to fill the environmental planner position that was approved in the budget for this year. In addition, Longmont should allocate funds to hire additional park rangers to enforce regulations regarding our parks and open spaces. I also strongly consider, uh, strongly uh, suggest uh, you consider hiring a full-time volunteer coordinator. Thank you. All right, the next caller is 060. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. And the caller after this one is 065. Hi, I see you've unmuted you zero. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mayor Bagley and City Council. Uh, my name is AJ Ramirez and I live at 2319 uh, Billings Lane in Longmont. And I am calling about the uh, cannabis delivery. I have been a patient uh, since 2014 after misdiagnosis and a botched spinal surgery with a defective implant uh, caused me from living the life of a professional athlete to that of a physically handicapped and disabled individual. I am here to advocate for patients that are physically handicapped and disabled of all kind. Uh, regardless of how handicapped accessible a dispensary might be, it does not atone for the amount of traffic that could be there at the time that a disabled person shows up. Uh, delivery would heavily mitigate these um, issues and also help negate uh, COVID transferences. Um, so what I would like to do is also speak up for Native Roots and ask that you allow them to deliver to Longmont. Uh, through trial and error, I have realized that they are the most patient-friendly dispensary in the city of Longmont. Um, this is coming from someone who's done patient advocacy in multiple states, um, and I implore you guys to please think of the patients during this decision-making process. Thank you. All right, next caller. The next caller is 065. 065, I'm going to ask you to unmute. And the next caller is 119 after this. Caller 065. There you are. Can you hear us? Good evening. Yep. Hi, my name's Abby Driscoll. I live at 1304 Lupine Court. I'm here tonight as chair of the board for Sustainable Resilient Longmont. I wanted to let you all know tonight that this week is National Drive Electric Week. Sustainable Resilient Longmont is celebrating with two events that I wanted to make sure you know about. First, we'll ha we're having a live webinar on um, this Thursday, the 24th from 6 to 8 p.m. We're excited to have Christine Berg from the state of Colorado, Elise Jones from Boulder County, and Francie Jaffe from the city of Longmont to present about the steps they are taking to transition to electric vehicles. This event will also feature a virtual tour of three different types of electric vehicles, a Fiat, Tesla, and even an electric motorcycle. 
and, and, and an EV owner's panel to answer all of your questions about what's involved with owning and driving an EV. Then on Saturday, we'll be hosting an EV motorcade down Main Street. Starting at 5 p.m. at Roosevelt Park, we'll head south on Main and take a U-turn at 3rd Ave. Special thanks to the Longmont Police Department for assisting us with this. In addition, we have sent Council a copy of a draft resolution declaring Longmont a Go EV City. This is a critical step forward for our community to combat climate change, since carbon emissions from transportation represent one-third of total greenhouse gas emissions statewide. And in 2020, it outpaced electric power as the number one contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in Colorado. We must be bold about our approach to mitigating climate change and electrification of transportation is a key part of how we get there. The goal of this resolution is a vision statement with a set of goals to support Longmont moving as rapidly as possible to electrify our transportation. Other localities have already taken action, including the city and county of Denver, Boulder County, the city of Boulder, and resolutions are underway in Summit and Eagle counties. You can find out more at goevcity.org. And of course, on our website at srlongmont.org. I urge city council to adopt the Go EV Cities resolution, commit to 100% electric and zero emission vehicles, and make Longmont a Go EV City. Thank you, and I hope to see some of you later this week at Longmont Electric Vehicle Week. All right, next caller. Thanks, Abby. All right, the next caller is 119. I'm going to ask you to unmute 119. Next after this call is 373. So I am calling on 119. Please unmute. There you are. Hi. <laughs> um, hi, this is Karen Dyke, 708 Hayden Court. Mr. Mayor and council members, there is a lot in the news the last few weeks or the last week about whether there is hypocrisy when federal judges are named and confirmed. I think we can bring this discussion front and center here in Longmont. This week, PRPA will be discussing whether to sanction a plan that includes building a gas plant for electricity generation. This will commit us to fracked gas over the next 40 years, or we will be left with stranded assets. In early 2017, the Longmont City Council passed a resolution that says they are committed to 100% renewable energy. Back in 2016, candidates for the City Council, including many currently on the Council, stated support for 100% renewable energy. Now there seems to be waffling by PRPA because it won't be easy. It is okay not to be easy. It isn't easy to fight the forest fires either. It is time for this council to state that they meant what they said in 2017 and ask Longmont PRPA directors, Mayor Bagley and David Hornbacher to vote against committing to a fracked gas plant. They can tell PRPA to go back to the drawing board and submit a plan that will meet the commitment of 100% renewable energy for Longmont and the other cities involved. We have to say no hypocrisy is allowed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. All right, uh, actually, I've got, I've got somebody online. Uh, they couldn't get through. So I'm gonna call them now, they're on my phone. So hold on one second. The, uh, I don't know this person. She got somebody's, hold on one second. Are you, are you there, ma'am? I'm still here, yes, thank you. All right, hold on, you've got three minutes. If you can go ahead and say your name and your, your uh, address for the record, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Jerry Shepard. I'm an attorney from Greeley, my office address is 710 11th Avenue, Suite 203D, really 80631. I am also a longtime member of the Normal Legal Committee and on the Board of Directors for Colorado Normal. Thank you to Ashley Weber for connecting us and for connecting with all of you. I'm actually calling about the uh, proposed cannabis delivery 
bill and I am encouraging you all to adopt it. I mean, it would certainly be um, helpful for patients, especially people who can't get out or are concerned about COVID. It would also facilitate the socially distant deliveries. Um, I would I would ask to omit the portion that talks about some sort of camera thing. It sounds more like an invasion of privacy and civil liberties. Um, I give mad props to the Longmont City Council for trying to facilitate um, people being able to use cannabis as appropriate. Um, and I would ask that you continue with that trend. I'm open for questions, but thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you very much. All right, next caller. Next caller in our list, your phone number ends in 373. 373, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. There you are. Can you hear us? Hi, yes, hi, good evening. This is Amy Sharp, CEO of Sharp Solutions Courier. In today's environment, patients find it necessary to have safe, discreet, and reliable home delivery. It is extremely necessary that you allow this service to your constituents. Sharp Solutions was founded to provide this type of service to patients. As a member of rulemaking for the House Bill 19-1234, I have a thorough understanding of the compliance and regulations required to safely implement these services in your jurisdiction. I respectfully request that you opt into this service for the benefit of your constituents. Thank you for your time and consideration. All right, next caller. How many we got left? About what, six, seven? Let me count. Just out of curiosity. We have five left. All right, next caller. The next caller I'm gonna unmute is 418. Caller 418, can you hear us? There you are. Yes, uh, I, this is on speakerphone, so I don't know how well I sound. Um, am I fairly clear? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Can, can you okay. state your, your name and your address for the record, please? Uh, okay, uh, I'm Stan Toll. Uh, I live in kind of the northern area of Lawnmont. And th the reason I'm calling is kind of like what Mark Twain said, you know, uh, the law treats everybody equally. Uh, both the rich and poor are re uh, uh, prohibited from sleeping under bridges. Um, one of the issues I'm talk call calling about is that there's, a certain number of residents that really aren't being uh, uh, allowed to participate in putting input their needs into the community. Um, one of the things that happened with this pandemic is that there's a certain number of our community lost the access to bathrooms, showers, and places where they could um, uh, get shelter during the day. And one of the things I did is I worked on, tried to get some of the restrooms opened during this time. And sometimes I go around relatively late and try to make sure that there's some sort of restrooms accessible late at night. Um, and of course, like earlier this week, I found uh, a couple of young women and a guy basically camping in one of our, our restrooms. And this is because the city really hasn't been looking to make sure that people have something even so small as like a restroom area that they could probably uh, get shelter in. Now, you know, we say, well, they have a shelter here. Well, maybe there's a considerable number of people who are not being allowed to use the shelter. and then there's the problem that the shelter is not necessarily a good place uh, to uh, congregate, you know, for a COVID situation. So my suggestion is to allow people input into city policies that are tend to be presently excluded because a lot of this is city policies because 
small places like that used to be available when I first moved into town, reasonably cheap, like $10, $12 a night. You could get uh, a simple hotel room. These same places are 80 to to $100 a night. And this is causing people, even though they could probably get some money together, they can't get a place that they can afford. And this is my thinking policy because the shutting down of all sorts of restrooms and showers and other stuff is actually appears to me being directly directed at these people. Stan, Stan I'm going and, to cut you, I'm gonna have to cut you off. That's almost three and a half minutes, but we appreciate your, okay, your input. Well, thank you get you, it. Thanks, Stan. Thank you very much. All right, we have another caller that got dropped off, and I'm going to go ahead and call them at this time. Hold on a second. All right, Ashley Weber, are you there? I am, yes. All right, if we go ahead and state your name and address for the record, you've got three minutes. All right, good evening, Mayor Begley and council members of Longmont. My name is Ashley Weber, and I live on Feather Reed Avenue in Longmont. I'm executive director for the nonprofit organization Colorado Normal. Our mission is to move public opinion by working with government officials to progress the growing cannabis community. We want to assure cannabis consumers have access to high quality cannabis that is safe, convenient, and affordable. We've helped draft Longmont's hunger ordinance and want to thank the council so much for our input in this cannabis delivery discussion. Our organization supports the proposed marijuana delivery code and would respectfully suggest minimal changes which have a significant impact on both dispensaries and consumers. House Bill 1234, signed into law in 2019, created framework and the regulatory system for cannabis home delivery. As a harmful mitigation by establishing marijuana delivery is significant. Medical patients who cannot access their medicine, especially those people who are homebound, are most harmed by not providing what's appropriate delivery. Without saying COVID-19, its impact extends to the needs for delivery of cannabis so much as it extended for many other essential businesses. As you're aware, cannabis dispensaries were deemed essential and we see our population, specifically those whose life experience is improved with their proper medications. This language should include courier or transporter services who partner with dispensaries for safe deliveries to consumers in un unincorporated areas or other counties. This helps both dispensaries, consumers, and will create revenue. Residents of Colorado and a resident of Longmont can currently receive food, alcohol, prescriptions, narcotics directly to their front doors without videotaped interactions, ID checks, or signatures. Requiring this for cannabis delivery seems a bit intrusive. We would ask body cameras be removed from code as state regulations already mandate GPS tracking cameras both inside and outside with a 360 view around the delivery vehicle. In constructing this language, let's be thoughtful beginning 2021, recreational cannabis delivery will begin and it would be helpful to have in place guardrails and guidance to start January 1st, 2021. As called upon, Colorado Normal will continue to contribute services, draft language, provide Support, including education, reliable information, and valuable support to help Longmont Cannabis Delivery be a success. Colorado Normal offers its full support for the proposed code changes to allow for marijuana delivery. Thank you for your time and consideration. All right. Thank you, Ms. Weber. You're welcome. All right, next caller. Mayor, the next caller. That I'm going to unmute. Your call, your number ends in nine five six nine five six. I'm going to ask you to unmute. There you are. Hello, um, my name is Courtney Styles, and I live um, on Independence Street in Longmont. Um, I'm just calling to advocate for medical delivery um, here in Longmont. Uh, let's see. I feel that it's an important step to aid in proper care for the medical patients. Um, I've seen the result that Native Roots Dandelion has done in Boulder regarding the medical delivery. I've seen nothing but the best results come from them. Um, reviews on how medical patients have the ease of not having to drive to the location is essential 
since most of them have serious medical conditions, that makes small tasks become very large and painful ones. Um, I've been a patient at Native Roots Longmont for over five years, and to have any dispensary start doing medical delivery, I think Native Roots would be the best. Um, they're extremely compliant with all their laws as well, have uh, a lot of care and knowledge for their patients. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, thank you for your time. And that is all. All right, thank you. Next call. The next caller, your phone number ends in 002. I'm gonna ask you to unmute 002. And the last caller after that will be 975, and you can get ready. 002, do you um, hear me? Yeah. Great, yeah. thanks. Hi. Hi. Hey, thanks for allowing me to comment. Uh, Mayor Bagley and distinguished city council members, my name is Michael Song, and I think I have a unique perspective um, in this area. My background is as follows. I'm a graduate of West Point, I was a federal prosecutor in Washington, D.C., and pretty much all we did was fight the war on drugs. I was the chief deputy DA in Denver, but most notably, I was the first marijuana attorney for Colorado at the attorney general's office. As such, my job in 2014 was to train all law enforcement officers on the new laws of cannabis. I also served as the liaison to shareholders, which included the governor's office, legislature, the Marijuana Enforcement Division, and town and city officials. Now I'm in private practice and service a lot of cannabis clients. As the city manager noted in these times, public safety is of the utmost importance. And this holds true for the cannabis industry. Thus, I strongly support cannabis home delivery. Bottom line, this is a safe way for consumers to receive cannabis products at their homes when they cannot or do not want to leave their home. Agree with it or not, medical and adult use cannabis has been deemed critical and essential across the state. Thus, it is of the utmost importance that cities offer this type of service. I know there may be concerns regarding the safety of the service, but I can assure you from my dealings with law enforcement officers and the Marijuana Enforcement Division the industry has not only vetted the individuals working in the industry, but also has ensured the security of the process. Right, sir, Proper yeah. record keeping. Sir, I, you're, you're, thank you so much for your comments. You have no idea how, how uh, you're obviously very, very, uh, uh, what your three minutes is up, but we really appreciate your insight and your input. We do. We do. All right, next caller. Mayor, the last caller is 975. I'm going to ask you to unmute 975. Are you there? Hi, can you hear me? We sure can. You may begin. Great. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to call in and, and uh, voice my support for homeowners in the area being able to utilize Airbnb as a, as a means of alternative income. As a young homeowner in Longmont, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to afford things, and it's nice to know that if times get really hard, we can make a little extra money. And I know that there is some talk about some problem Airbnb properties in the area, and, and uh, I would say that's probably the minority of what's going on. And I just am a big supporter of property rights. That's all. Thank you a lot for your time. Have a great Sir, night. could you state your name for the record? I apologize. My name is Stephen. Last name's Altman, and I live in Southmore Park. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That concludes first call public invited to be heard. Let's move on to the consent, consent agenda. Can you go ahead and read that for us, Don? Yes, I can, Mayor. Item 9A is Ordinance 2020-39, a bill for an ordinance amending Chapter 6.70, of the Longmont Municipal Code to permit medical marijuana delivery, public hearing and second reading scheduled for October 13th, 2020. 9B is Ordinance 2020-40, a bill for an ordinance amending Chapters 2.68 on local licensing authority, 6.70 on marijuana stores, and Chapter 9.60 on medical and recreational marijuana, public hearing and second reading scheduled for October 13, 2020. 9C is Ordinance 2020-41, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the City of Longmont to lease the real property known as Vance Brand Municipal Airport Hangar Parcel H74 to Best Steel LLC, public hearing and second reading scheduled for 
October 13, 2020. Uh, nine, D is ordinance 2020-42, bill for an ordinance authorizing the city of Longmont to lease the real property known as Vance Brand Municipal Airport Hangar Parcel H32 to George and Evelyn Grell. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for October 13, 2020. 9E is Ordinance 2020-43, a bill for an ordinance conditionally approving the vacation of access, utility, and drainage easements associated with the Highlands subdivision generally located north of Highway 119 and west of County Line Road. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for October 13, 2020. 9F is Resolution uh, 2020-93, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and the University of Colorado for socio-technical design for a middleware information exchange hub. 9G is Resolution 2020-94, a resolution of the Longmont City Council authorizing agreements between the City of Longmont and Riverset LLC for the purchase of real property for the Resilient St. Brain Project. 9H is Resolution 2020-95, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City and the Colorado Department of Transportation for grant funding to support the Main Street Revitalization Project. 9I is Resolution 2020-96, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City and the 20th Judicial District for a Victim Assistance and Law Enforcement Grant. 9J is Resolution 2020-97, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the grant application for an intergovernmental agreement between the City and the Colorado Department of Public Safety, Division of Criminal Justice Office for Victims Grant Programs for grant funding for victim services. 9K is Resolution 2020-98, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City and the Regional Air Quality Council for grant funding for electric vehicle charging stations. 9L is Resolution 2020-99, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the City to apply for a grant from the Colorado Department of Local Affairs for grant funding for the Peace Officer Mental Health Grant Program. 9M is Resolution 2020-100, a resolution of the Longmont City Council naming the Union Reservoir Swim Beach in honor of former Longmont Mayor Fred Wilson. 9N approved $25,000 grant from the Temple Hoyne Buell Foundation to support the Longmont Early Childhood Bright Eyes Initiative. 9O is approved amendment to Boulder Air Contract Addendum. And 9P is approved one Capital Improvement Program Amendment. All right. Um, before I do, I, I'd like to pull uh, uh, number A or letter A. Councilmember Martin. I would also like to pull uh, letter F. All right. I'm going to actually move the consent agenda. Oh, Councilmember Christensen. Um, I would also like to pull items G, K, and H. G, K, and H. Now, now, now it's just got, I don't have a pen. I, I'm going to move Mayor, the, yeah. pardon me, sorry. Staff, also in your script, staff would like to pull 9M for a very brief presentation. All right. So I'm going to move the consent agenda, less A, F, Polly, help me please, G. G. K, K, H, H, and I believe Don wants to pull M. All right. And mine are mostly just comments, not. All right. Councilor Peck, you want to second that? Yes, but first of all, I don't have that uh, list up in front of me. So I just want to uh, ask, is the air quality monitoring one being pulled? And is the marijuana one being pulled? Yes, I pulled that one. I think Marsha Martin pulled the, pulled the other, so. Thank you, then I will second that. All right. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, Council Member Peck is asking about item 9O, the Boulder oh. Air contract. Oh, sorry. Let's go ahead that and pull it. That's not been pulled. Yeah, All pull right. that one, please. We'll pull that one, too. So we're <laughs> All right. All in favor of not passing the consent agenda. No, just, uh, <laughs> just kidding. All in favor of passing the consent agenda minus those letters, and we'll go through them one at a time. Um, say aye. 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 Opposed? Say nay. All right. We'll get that. We'll, we'll, we'll figure that all out in a second. All right. 10A. Ordinance 2025, or sorry, Ordinance 2020-35, an ordinance authorizing the issuance of the City of Longmont, Colorado, open space sales and use tax revenue, refunding and improvement bond series 2020. Is there a staff report? There is not, correct? All right. That's correct. Any questions for council? All right, seeing none, um, let's go ahead and open it for public hearing. Um, we're gonna go ahead and take a two to three minute break. And if you're going to comment on any of the public hearings on ordinances on second reading, you need to call in now and then wait on the line as we as we hit them back in three
right, for the caller that we just let in, uh, we will get uh, started again shortly. And when we're ready, I will ask you to unmute by calling out the last three digits of your phone number. Make sure that you've muted the live stream and that you're listening to your, your telephone for directions. Thanks. here still. All right, looks like all of us. Okay, so let's go ahead and open the public hearing for ordinance 2020-35. Is there anybody in here? Mayor, we do have one caller. I'm not can, sure which item that they want ask, to speak can you on. Ask, can you ask, can we have them see what, uh, what, what they're talking on? Yes, we can, Mayor. Caller 198, I'm going to ask you to unmute if you could. Please tell us which item, hearing item under the agenda that you would like to speak on. Hello. Th Hello. This is, yeah. Uh, sir, what, what, what item are you going to speak on? I'm guessing. I was going to, yeah, Go I was going to speak about the, um, the smart meters uh, issue and the, um, uh, the renewable energy. Um, uh, so n no specific ordinance on second sec no 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 uh, second ordinance tonight. I'm not sure which which ordinance it would be. Um, I understand that the uh, Longmont is is wanting um, to have a, a sustainable energy grid for the future, and, and part right. of that is so, yeah, so, wireless yeah. smart meter. Right. So can we have, so right. So we had first call public invited be heard and it's a regular session meeting. We're going to, we're going to have public invited be heard at the end. Um, right now okay. we're, we're asking for input regarding um, reading ordinances on second reading, meaning specific issues. And uh, I'm okay. going to ask, and, and uh, I'm going to ask that you call back at the end of the meeting regarding just for the public invited to be heard and we can hear your comments for three minutes. Is that okay, sir? Yeah, of course. Yeah, All right. that'd be fine. All right, thank you, sir. Okay, thank All you. Right. All right, um, seeing nobody else, let's go ahead and close the public hearing on Ordinance 2020-35. All right, any discussion from council? Seeing none, can I have a motion? Councilmember Waters? I'm, I move approval of Ordinance 2020-35. I'll second that. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, ordinance 2020-35 passes unanimously. All right, ordinance 2020-36, a bill for an ordinance making additional appropriations for expenses and liabilities of the city of Longmont for the fiscal year beginning January 1, 2020. Are there any questions from council? Dr. Waters? Sir, you're muted. You're muted. Now I'm unmuted, I think. Am I unmuted? Thank you. Yes. You're, you're unmuted. Thank you for, for calling on me, Mayor Bagley. And my apologies for continuing to mute myself, I guess. Um, Teresa, I know you're on the call and you're probably ready to answer questions about this. But this, I asked a question last week when we were you were doing budget presentation. And this is a perfect example of where I just need more information. So, um, when you've, with your coded, with the way you've coded the expenditures, those with the two asterisks are the, are new funding or, or, or uh, appropriation of new funding. It, can I assume that that was money uh, uh, that was budgeted for something in 2019, but not this, 
it, its budget balance from 2019 that we're now appropriating for expenditure on these items in 2020. So Mayor and City Council, Teresa Malloy, Budget Manager, Councilman Waters, so, so fund balance could be, um, like you said, funds that were budgeted in 19 and not used for that or not spent um, and, not, and not needed. They could have been budgetary savings. They could also have come from um, really any year prior to, to 2019 as well. Um, it could also have been uh, revenue that came in greater than what our, um, our budget was set at. Um, so, so yes, it was, it's, it's fund balance from operations from prior years. As compared to carryover, which was budgeted for a purpose, carried over for the same purpose Correct. as part of an appropriation. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Teresa. I that was just that was just my question. I just wanted to clarify. That's what I thought I heard last week. I apologize for you know being such a knucklehead on this, but um, I just I want to be clear um, what, what we're doing. Thanks. All right. Um, Let's go ahead and open the public hearing, but nobody's on the line, so we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, can we have a motion? Dr. Uh, Dr. Waters, you want to unmute yourself? And... I will. I will um, move approval of Ordinance 2020-36. Councilor Christensen, you almost did it. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Moved by Dr. Waters, seconded by Councilor Christensen. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. All right, ordinance 2020-36 passes unanimously. Ordinance 2020-37, a bill for an ordinance repealing and reenacting chapter 15.05.020 of the Longmont Municipal Code on the protection of streams and creeks, wetlands, repairing areas, and 15.05.030 on habitat and species protection and amending chapters 15.08.070 on non-conforming structures and 15.10-020 on all other terms defined. Councilmember Christensen. This uh, a few weeks ago, um, I thought that we voted to include in this rare native fish and rare wetland songbirds, uh, wetland and songbirds, and I don't see that anywhere in the uh, in the revised ordinance. Can um, somebody is David here? Can somebody point that out to me? Or did we not approve that? I believe. I don't remember. I, I thought it was redundant. No, no, not really. No, 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 no. A I'm not separate saying, thing. I, I just, yeah, anyway, I don't, rec I don't recall. Joni, your face popped up. Were you going to address that? Joni Marsh. Mayor Bagley, members of council. So I um, have just discovered, uh, Eugene and I, that the ordinance revisions that were made um, per your comments on the 8th, in fact, are not the ordinance that are in your packet. That ordinance was published, um, we believe. Um, and I've sent Don a message to check on that, but that is not the correct ordinance in your packet tonight. It is missing okay. Council Member Christensen's um, wording. Um, so so we my, need to... real, real quick then. So does anyone have a problem waiting two weeks so we can get the real, the, the actual, I mean, the actual ordinance into the, the, the packet so we can vote on what's there? Right. right. Okay. okay, so I'm actually going to suggest, I'm just going to, let's go ahead and pull it, and then we're going to wait, okay? Thank you. All right, Thank great. You. Thank let's you. Do, yeah, because let's, let's get them in there. All right, okay, let's move on to Ordinance 2020-38-10, or Item 10D, a bill for an ordinance organizing the LFM Business Improvement District, providing for an election of the Board of Directors of the District, and approving the 2020-2021 operating plan and budget for the district. Um, is there, are there any questions from Council? All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and open it for the public hearing, although there's nobody on the line. So we'll go ahead and close it. Um, let's have a motion, if we could, please. Joan, you're unmuted. Why don't you you make a motion? <laughs> ordinance 2020-38. Okay, I move uh, Ordinance 2020-38. I'll second it. All right, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Nay. All right, great. Now let's go ahead and go through the consent agenda. Starting with A, the only, um, I pulled that one. I guess the only question I have is 
you, Eugene, when I talked with you, um, is Eugene here? Hey, Eugene. Wait, so when, hey, so when we were going over the agenda, I had asked you to prepare some language. First of all, um, uh, are you ready to, uh, is there draft language available in order to include body, to remove the requirement for body cams? Uh, yes, there is. And actually, I'm going to uh, invite Tim Hole to join in on this conversation. He has uh, language drafted and, and looked at some perfect. of the other suggested amendments. Per perfect. I'm going to move that we actually adopt that language and remove the requirement that we have body cams. Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Any other, anybody disagree with that? All right. All in favor, say, oh, sorry. Wait, just, wait, just a second. Well, just get the hand up, Doc Waters. Come on. It's like, I mean, whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, come on. We got business to conduct. <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Waters. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, the language, you made reference to language that we haven't seen. I, I, don't, I, think, a, I, I think I support the idea, but. Yeah, yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm not saying the language itself. I told Eugene to be ready. So it's already done. And, and so I'm just, we're just directing him to come up with language to remove to the body cam, to the exclude body the body cams. So okay. on second reading, it'll come back and he, he, there won't be a headache. Council member Christensen. Won't that just entail removing that bullet, the entire bullet? Well, no, I, I was just making sure Eugene said he was going to draft the language. So, okay. so it's not, it's going to be, it, it's technically easy. So it's, I don't know if it's easy, but he's already done it. Council member Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, thinking about the comments that we have received over the past several weeks, it seems like with this, uh, with this ordinance, we're going right down the middle and, and adopting what nobody wants. Uh, that is, we've had a, a strong push for native roots and normal to um, include uh, out of city services to be allowed to deliver. And I believe that's not in the ordinance unless it changed. So, so Martin, so Marcia, time out. So we're, we're right now, let's take comments on this one motion because I think we're going to get to what you're talking about in just a sec. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's all right. So all in favor. Hey, Bagley, uh, man, may I step in really quick? Uh, oh, there you are. Tim, yes. Go ahead. Mayor Badley and members of the council, Tim Hall, Assistant City, council, uh, city Attorney. I, I drafted the language the mayor requested um, in preparation for this hearing. So the body camera subject, it would just be deleting the entire uh, subparagraph. So that would be 670-230-I-4 would just be deleted in its entirety. And then I'm going to withdraw the motion and actually move that we just delete that section. Second. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Sorry, Councilman Martin, do you have a comment? That's my aye. Oh, okay. All opposed, say nay. All right. The motion passes unanimously. Um, I'm also going to move that we allow, sorry, Councilor Peck. Uh, actually, I would, excuse me, I would like to thank you for removing that. And just to address that transporter uh, question. That's what I was going to do next, but go ahead. Okay, after reading the, uh, after reading the legislation on it, I, I was going to ask for it to be deleted as well, because it looks like the state does not require body cameras for transporters. They have to be licensed and permitted through the state. And the reason I wanted it removed was that it would, if we had body cameras, it would probably hamstring any transporter that any marijuana uh, dispensary that wanted to use home delivery would be able to use because they are ready, they're already licensed through the state, they're already available, but they don't require cameras. So if Longmont requires cameras, that limits the transporters that any dispensary can use. So that was my reasoning for wanting it out. All right, great. Thanks, Councilmember Peck. All right, I'm actually going to move that we instruct uh, the city attorney's office to prepare draft language, which I think they've already prepared, um, that would enable uh, dispensaries to actually contract with uh, state regulated uh, uh, delivery services. Is that a motion? Yes, that's a motion. Second. All right, it's been mo moved and seconded. Anybody opposed to that idea that want to talk? All right, all, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, that motion passes unanimously. 
And then last but not least, I was going to actually move that we instruct the city attorney's office to prepare a draft language, which I think they've already uh, uh, done in order to permit those dispensaries in the enclaves of Boulder County within our city or adjacent to our city and within our city to be permitted and included in the delivery service. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. And the reason why I'm making that motion is A, there's only one native roots. And then the second thing is we'll get the sales tax. So um, all in, anybody opposed to that? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Say nay. All right. That passes unanimously. I'd actually move passage. Mr. Of Mayor, may I ask yeah, a go clarifying ahead. question? Sure, go ahead. Was the motion to just allow county enclaves to, to deliver in the city or any any licensed marijuana it's the, center? It's the, it's the, it's the motion was specifically for those Boulder County stores within the city. That was the specific motion. Um, do you want to provide, we, we'd feel more than, more than happy to hear your suggestion on why we might enable other, in talking with the city attorney and Harold, their concern was that um, we wouldn't be able to regulate it. We wouldn't be, I mean, we wouldn't be able to collect the sales tax, et cetera. But I mean, I, I only made the motion because there was only one, one dispensary that really was concerned and they were being left out. What, what are your thoughts, Tim? If I might, Mayor, real quick before Tim Go ahead. his wisdom, that is how I captured that motion how, that you put how did you, on. How did you capture it? That it uh, to permit dispensaries in enclaves adjacent to the city to be permitted to provide delivery in city limits. Yeah, that was it. Councilmember Christensen? Um, it, but that means that everyone can deliver not just the enclaves, correct? No, it was just the enclaves. I was focusing on native roots, but if somebody wants to make a motion and expand it, I mean, do we want Denver dispensaries delivering in Longmont? No, I mean, I thought that this motion period, the, the ordinance would allow any licensed, um, anyone licensed within uh, the city, well. Hmm. Yeah, Lo Lo Longmont and Boulder County. So basically the little yes. enclaves, we, the ordinance originally yeah. was just for the city and then right. Native Roots called and said, well, wait, what about us? We're not okay. in the city, we're in the county, we're in the enclave. So it was, it was to, to get them to be able to deliver as well. Yeah, I I I know. Know. but it doesn't mean that we're not pitting them against each other. They can no, all no, no. deliver. Okay. Yes, yes. Go ahead, okay. Tim. This, this issue might need a little bit more uh, research by the city attorney's office. It's, it's not entirely clear whether the statutory authority allows us to um, pick and choose outside of the jurisdiction. It's clear that we can say so, either inside of our jurisdiction or not inside of our jurisdiction. Got it. And then uh, in, the, in the event that you determine that we cannot limit it and discriminate, um, I move that we actually include all uh, dispensaries and permit them to deliver inside the city. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, that motion carries unanimously. Does that clarify your job, Tim? It sure does. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. All right, perfect. Um, then, I, then I believe uh, I moved ordinance. Did we already vote on ordinance 2020-39? I don't think we did, right? Mayor, so could you pause one second? Yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> I just need to catch up. I can't keep, I can't go that quickly. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of motions. We, we're getting work done tonight. Okay, now if you want to go ahead and do, you're going to. Whatever we're going to do. Ord I move ordinance 2020-39. Second. All right. It's, uh, I think it was, uh, was that moved by Councilmember Christensen? Sorry, seconded by Councilmember Christensen? Okay, well, I saw a hand. I don't know who it was, but we'll, we'll take Polly. All right, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, great. Okay, now I'm going to need some help. Uh, we um, see here, we pull, was the next one was F, right? If we could go to M. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Let's, uh, that's true. Let's do M next because we have a guest. So let's go ahead to resolution 2020-100, a resolution renaming or just naming the swim beach after Fred Wilson. I believe uh, uh, Mayor Lang is here. Hold on one second. Let's. Mayor Bagley, um, yep. council members. 
David Bell, um, Director of Parks and Natural Resources. Um, staff pulled this tonight, um, basically so we should, could share, um, I think we heard from the um, former mayor's daughter, some of the happy stories that we heard a little bit through this process of moving this forward in the naming of the Swim Beach after former mayor um, Wilson. So um, I never had the pleasure of meeting the mayor, um, but I did have the opportunity to talk to friends and family and city staff members that shared lots of their stories. So really, instead of me trying to retell those stories, we did ask um, former Mayor Roger Lang to come on and talk about some of his memories and um, why he thinks it's important to move this forward. So if we can bring former Mayor Roger Lang on, he can share some of his stories with us. I think he's here. Can you hear me? We sure can. All right. All right. So Mayor Bagley and city council members, uh, as your packet tells you, this is a resolution to uh, name the Union Reservoir Swim Beach in the honor of former Mayor Fred Wilson. As you heard earlier, his daughter did a pretty good job of describing his passion involved in this. And uh, he spent many, many hours uh, trying to do the right thing for Union Reservoir. And uh, I think his family is very, uh, very eager to see something done in his honor. And this would some, be something that we thought would be appropriate to uh, pre present some signage down there that people would recognize that uh, Fred Wilson has done an awful lot to make this happen. And as he said, the Union Reservoir was not the same re Union Reservoir when he started this endeavor, and now it's uh, widely popular. And uh, so he's he's done a great deal, and we're just trying to recognize him somehow. And I'm, I'm going to keep this fairly short, but I think you've heard it. Your packet has a lot of information that supports this also. I just, uh, I just wanted to have a side note about Fred, and I don't know how many people know Fred, but he... Uh, probably appeared to people to be a rather serious person, but he really inside, he uh, he was quite a prankster. And I'll just give you an example and then, uh, then we can move on. But when I uh, was sworn in as mayor, Fred and I were on city council together and uh, he came to me and he said, you know, Roger, uh, you gotta understand the transition between being a council member and a mayor is a big step. And uh, you might be struggling with it a little bit if you're just like anybody else. And uh, he said, I've got two tips for you. And, they, and you got to do both of them if you're going to have the transition really make, uh, make its full round. He said, first of all, you got to act like a mayor. I said, well, all right, Fred, that, that's good information. Uh, what's the second one? He said, you got to look like a mayor. And I said, well, that's, that's interesting too. And he said, uh, I might not be able to help you much on how you act like a, like a mayor, but he says, I think I can help you look like a mayor. And by, with that, he pulled out of his sack and he gave me his hat. And he says, if you can't look or act like a mayor, at least you're gonna look like a mayor. And so I wish you the best going forward. And that's a little bit of Fred Wilson that maybe I knew and maybe you didn't know, but I, I would hope you look favorably on this resolution because he put a lot of work into Union Reservoir and I would, uh, I would hope this would move forward. So that's that's basically the story I've got. All right, that, nice thank hat, you. right, Brian? Yeah, I, I, I need one and a monocle, please. <laughs> All right, with that, I'd, I'd like to, I'd actually like to move uh, resolution 2020-100. I move that we um, name the Union Reservoir Swim Beach in honor of former Longmont Mayor Fred Wilson. Second. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Councilmember Christensen. Wilson was, I didn't know Fred Wilson personally, but I certainly, we all heard a lot from Fred and he walked this town every single block of this town many, many times. He knew this town one up and down and he was a really interesting man with many, many different um, interests and uh, he's one of my favorite mayors. Um, so when I look around, I see everybody's smiling and it's nice to have something that we all feel really good about. This is a terrific idea. And I was really touched that uh, uh, Mr. Lang, Mayor Lang and um, um, Fred's daughter, Val uh, Ms. Valentine uh, called up. Thanks. All right, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right. 
Um, the swim beach in honor of former mayor Fred Wilson. Um, the resolution is passed. It's done. So enjoy Fred's beach. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mayor Lang. All right, let's go back up to the top. I believe that we were going to, somebody pulled F. Polly, was that you? Yep, that was me. Let me see why. Oh, Marcia. that's the middleware. No, Marsha pulled that. All right, Marsha, middleware. Yes, middleware. Middleware. <laughs> so, um, uh, I, I feel like the, the requirements for the outcome of this project are uh, a little bit thin in that uh, it's hard to tell except for maybe from one report to the other uh, what the scope, the actual scope of work really is. I mean, I uh, am for the general concept and I think that uh, I, have, I have respect for uh, the principles of Archithot and think that they're probably a good candidate. Um, but I sure wish that, that a little bit more was known about what was gonna happen. Um, you know, I've, I feel burned before in terms of asking for, for um, uh, IT enhancements. And I, I bitterly remember being told, uh, well, we don't really do our own software development. And, and now, you know, here we are contracting for essentially a custom middleware project. So uh, is there any chance, is there, is there, are there more requirements extant uh, for this than, uh, than what we've been presented with? Because I don't think it's enough to make a judgment about whether this is going, well, first of all, there is no statement of purpose other than um, you know, general integration of, of different things that the city has. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the requirements could start with a list of, of where the barriers are. And if the barriers, if enumerating them is, is, the, uh, is the job of the first report, then let's say that. Um, and then we can make another appropriation decision after we've seen the first report and know what the um, concrete requirements are. Um, but, but right now it's really hard to, um, uh, hard to know what we're buying for this $175,000. All right. Uh, so are you making a motion that we don't approve it, Marsha? No, I am asking. I am asking the question of the people who have brought this forward. Uh, is there more information available to us that we can learn to judge this. I'm not ready to move. You know, to upvote it or downvote it yet. Either. Karen, Karen, is that you? Uh, yeah, Mayor Bagley and Councilmember Martin. Um, I'm going to uh, also invite. We have Eliberto Mendoza, and um, and also our city manager has been um, heavily involved in this. So. Um, and they're going to speak more to the technical aspects, but this particular project, uh, so we have been working on this project since um, it's, it's probably been about two years. So your question about what is the nature of the, the problem, where are the barriers, we do have um, all of that information in already prepared in, in a report. So we have been gathering that information over the last uh, couple of years. It is not in your packet. We certainly can bring that back with more um, detail, but we have, um, we have identified, we've had a group of probably over 75 stakeholders that have met um, for uh, at least five or six meetings. We've had focus groups. So we have collected all of the, um, the, the challenges and the barriers uh, for, for the, the various providers that are, are serving some of the same individuals. And, um, and, and that has really helped us to identify the, the next level of this, which is really to, um, to develop the software, the middleware software, 
that will allow for the exchange of information without integrating the databases. And so we do have all of that data captured um, and we certainly can bring that back. And then I would invite um, Eliberto or Harold to um, you know, talk more about what this particular phase is going to provide, what we're gonna get for our 175,000. Um, thank you, Ms. Roney. Uh, that, that is helpful. Um, I, I understand that the contractors have been very, very long suffering in this. <coughs> so I have, um, I feel a little regretful about, um, you know, asking to see the requirements and then wait, bring it back on first reading in, again in two more weeks. Um, it, I think this is probably a question for the mayor. If we received the requirements and we passed this on first reading with the understanding that the um, requirements would be incorporated um, into the work statement as an attachment, um, could we take it as an amended second reading or do we really, really have to? This is, this is a resolution. Yeah, so that means it, 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 it passes oh, now. No it's also an, so, and it's also an agreement. So uh, we either pass it or kick it back. But Eugene? Okay. What you said, Mayor, or we could continue and, and give us a two week block to come back with revisions. I'm gonna actually move that we, we I mean, Mark, Mark, well, the thing is, well, first of all, you need to make a motion one way or another if you wanna, if you want to do something, Marsha, you know. Okay, so. well then I, I move that we continue the resolution. But, um, but, but, but for what? What do you want to do? If we continue it, that's great, but we, have to, we all have to agree. Well, you interrupted me before I said it, Mayor Bagley. Well, go ahead. To continue it, to give us the opportunity to uh, read the document that Ms. Roney uh, has uh, referred to and make a determination as to whether it, it adequately specifies um, the statement of work, which what we have before us does not. And then have the, have the, have the um, like, document that she refers to uh, incorporated into the resolution as an attachment. I, I guess I, I would second that. I guess my thing is that we, we've done that already, but what, what specific change do we need to make in order to make it qualify? This is, this we is don't your know concern. until we see the document because this document doesn't really tell us very much. Right. But so, so Mayor, can I? Sure, go um, ahead, Karen. Mm -hmm. So what would be helpful is that, um, I mean, there is a statement of work that's attached to, um, that's attached to this document. So yeah, I read that one. So, so not the scope of work, but the statement of work that follows. So, okay, so that is not adequate from your perspective. Okay, no, just clarifying. Right, and so I guess what I'm saying is, Marcia, that we have yet to, if we continue it, we need four votes to instruct them to do something. So what I'm saying is by, by saying the motion to read about, I mean, to be stated is the motion is to continue it in order to make a determination whether it's adequate. But if you feel it's inadequate, what can they do to make it adequate? Well, well, Karen suggested that there is a much more detailed document already in existence that addresses the things that I was asking for, which is specific enumerations of, of the applications that need to communicate and uh, specific, uh, I don't know how to say this without waxing ridiculously technical, uh, data interchange formats to be supported, et cetera, et cetera. That's what middleware is. Middleware has a definition, but um, without, without an enumeration of that sort, um, it could be almost anything and you could, you know, integrate applications and say you were done. So, um, so your, your, is your motion to include that detail? Yes. The, doc, the doc, so the, am I to take your motion to, 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 to be that you are, you are, the motion is to continue the resolution two weeks um, so that city staff can, can 
uh, replace the current information with a more detailed document that you no. and Karen both? Karen says, Karen says the document already exists. I just want it to be provided to us and then we can review it. And, um, and if it is, if there are questions about that document, then um, we can discuss whether to pass the resolution at that time. Perfect, I'll second that. All right, um, Tim, Dr. Waters, you had, a, you had your hand up first. Well, I was just curious there, in the background, we see that this, been, this project has been submitted twice for funding uh, once to NSF. Um, uh, is, it, is it likely that um, the, there are tasks in that proposal that are responsive to the concerns that Council Member Martin has raised uh, that maybe this could be attached? Um, I don't think you could, I don't think you're going to get a proposal even reviewed by NSF without the kind of detail um, that, that she's asking for. Um, okay, so so it, even if we had, if you attach the the core of the NSF proposal, cut out all the other extraneous stuff that you would have to submit, um, that might suffice. Um, but I do have a, a kind of a related question, and I I asked this of Harold earlier today, and I, since since it was pulled off, I wouldn't have pulled it for this, but. Um, uh, just in terms of the scope, uh, the pro we're talking about uh, prototyping here, and I'm, I'm going to assume that the prototype represents a five to ten percent of the that investment of 175,000, probably five to ten percent of the total cost of development. Uh, and that if we have proof of concept as a result of prototyping, um, then we would do one of two things: that we'd either see a, a proposal to to invest for us to invest. With, with I hope the intent that they would we would license use of this to other municipalities to recover some of our development costs. Or we would then have an opportunity to invite other municipalities that were part of the proposal to, in, to invest with us to develop the midware that multiple mis, municipalities in Boulder County could use. Are there those, are, are there, are those intentions part of this? Yeah, so I'll jump in. Yes, the intention is to fully integrate the multiple systems that we have within the city, the county, and then eventually the statewide structure. And so part of what I was going to ask Council Member Martin is we also have a diagram in terms of the different systems that it needs to connect. Um, it, and I want to briefly kind of talk about what's happening. The, the problem is that we do not have a system that connects our social service systems to our public safety systems to our utility billing systems. And so what we rely on is human intelligence, many cases that doesn't catch things until we're weeks, if not months down the road with an individual. So what this has to, to be able to do in a HIPAA related environment because HIPAA becomes involved, is to connect these systems where at its most basic level, if we have somebody that has a client that is taken to the hospital, there is at least a ping that will connect the social service person to the emergency system to the hospital so they know what's going on. The, the example of the problem that we're having is we were working with someone on a tenant landlord issue. We had negotiated an agreement. The person was supposed to get back into the unit on day X. The hospital released them early and it created an issue with the tenant, but no one told our social workers that this was happening. And so what we're trying to do is essentially create a technical component to bridge the gaps where we know we're not catching things um, on the human intelligence side. And so we have a map of the different systems that we have within the organization and how this will connect it internally. That's the beta test because we know we're not doing it internal. We then wanna to go to the hospitals and the other social service agencies within the community so that they can see then proof of concept so we can start integrating and we're working more closely to ensure the health of, of the individuals of, in our community. When you see the National Science Foundation application, this even goes beyond that to say people can opt into it 
So I can opt into it if my mom lived in this community. So now not only are the agencies communicating with each other, they're also communicating with the caregivers of those individuals. And so they're made aware of these issues. So we have a diagram that lays all of that out if, if that's what you're looking for in the technical um, basis. Well, that's one component of a, a requirement specification. That's a context diagram. Right. And uh, yeah, that would be very helpful um, there are, I mean, uh, the arc between each system has a lot of different interfaces on it because there are data interfaces, there are event interfaces, and um, some of them have standard specifications and some of them don't. I am expecting, although I haven't looked at this particular problem for something like a decade, um, but um, you know, just the picture by itself, depending on how decorated it is, um, may or may not be enough. Um, but uh, I think Mayor Bagley suggested that the uh, technical specification of the NSF application would be a good addition. And then whatever the stakeholder comments that Karen has put together would be a good addition. It may be more than any of us wants to read, but we should at least have a shot at it especially if this is 10% of what the city intends to engage in over the next several years. All right, I'm gonna call on Councilor Peck. Just a quick reminder, it's 945 and we have a lot to go through still. So Councilor Peck. Um, you know, I'm very confused as to why we're doing this. Uh, our job really is just to make policy and it sounds like we're trying to micromanage staff. From what I've heard from Karen and Harold, they've got this under control and we'll be bringing it back to us. So, um, I, there is a, sorry, Joan, go ahead. So I would like to move this uh, without the, the amendments and the request that have been made. There's a motion already. I agree. Oh, 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 I, I got it, I got it, I got it. So yeah, there's a motion on the table right now right. to continue it two weeks to allow Karen and staff in order to, to, to bring it back and allow Councilor Martin and others who so wish to review the information. Uh, Councilor Martin. I would just like to say that I don't think this is in any wise micromanaging the staff. Um, every other expenditure that um, the council is asked to approve comes with the justification for why it should be made. And, um, you know, in the case of something that you can buy off the shelf, that expenditure is pretty easy to justify. But when you're talking about a project that as far as we have seen here is very open-ended, I think we need a little more boundaries than that, or we don't know what we're spending our money on. All right, with that, let's go ahead and vote on this. Come back in two weeks is the motion with this issue. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. 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 All right, raise your hand if you were nays. All right, the motion passes four to three with Council Member Hidalgo Faring, Council Member Peck, and Council Member Christensen against. And the four of us four, so we'll see it in two weeks. All right, let's go ahead and who pulled G? Somebody pulled G? Councilor Christensen. All right, thank you. Um, I just had a question. I. Um, uh, about what where this is um my uh live meeting doesn't work very well and i was able to look at the map a few days ago and now i cannot find it but anyway um i do have a pretty good visual memory so i'm wondering if it is the little uh blue triangle uh to the south of the river if if it's just that uh section of the river set, it's not the whole river set. It's just that little section that we need access to. Is that correct? Council member um, um, Christensen and mayor uh, Bagley, um, I'm looking at the vicinity map that's attached to your packet. Yeah. Uh, the parcel of land is immediately north of Boston Avenue and it is 
a total of 19,000 square feet. So yeah. to answer your question, no, it is not yeah. the entire river set area. Okay. But rather just that small uh, blue triangle. Okay, thank you. That's all I wanted to know. Yes. Thanks. Oh, I was turned around about, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Dale. Thanks. Um, I would move, uh, I would move resolution 2020-94. Second. Seeing no further debate, raise your hand and cut me off if I say that and you really, really want to say something. All right. We have a motion on the floor uh, by Councilor Christensen. I second it. Resolution 2020-94. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed aye. say nay. All right. Resolution 2020-94 passes unanimously. Um, who, Polly, did you also pull H? Okay, nobody pulled H. All right, did somebody pull I? No. H was pulled. H was, yes, Mayor, yeah, who, H was who pulled. Who pulled it? Who pulled it? Um, I, I thought staff was going to do a presentation. All right, no, I'm going to go ahead. That's all right. I move resolution 2020 95. Second. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, resolution 2020-95 passes unanimously. Um, I was not on the list, correct? Um, J was not on the list. K, someone pulled K. Uh, who pulled K? Councilor Christensen? <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, I'm in favor of electric vehicles, of course, because Everyone knows that this is this is what we're going to have in the future. We had electric vehicles in 1910, in fact, uh, but we got rid of them. Um, so let's bring them back. Um, I do have a problem. I have two problems. If we pass this without uh, any amendment, we've just spent a great deal of time um, converting a lot of our fleet to the uh, powered by powered by poo or powered by you system, and, which I think is, is a, a very good use of otherwise wasted uh, uh, gas. Um, I don't want that to be interfered with. Um, and the second problem I have is that um, I have a problem with subsidizing the infrastructure um, for electric vehicles. Um, why is it not, why are these charging stations not being created by private enterprise? The infrastructure for gas vehicles was entirely created by the oil and gas companies. And I would rather see us put the money into to, um, subsidizing electric vehicle stations into helping more people actually get electric vehicles because right now they're very unaffordable. So what we're doing essentially is subsidizing upper middle class people with taxpayer money. And what we need is to get more people to be able to buy an electric vehicle so that the price will come down as we get more and more people into it. You know, that's just how capitalism works. So um, I do have a problem with that. I would pass this anyway, but I'm just stating my opinion that I, I don't think that the cities should be providing uh, the infrastructure for electric vehicles. I think we should be providing subsidies to increase the number of electric vehicles available of eight, that people are able to buy. All right, do you want to make a motion? Actually, Councilmember Martin. Uh, if, if Paul wants to make her motion first, we can discuss it under the auspices of the motion. I don't care which. Um, or uh, I'm going to actually move resolution 2020-98. Somebody want to second it? We're not going to second the resolution? All right. Councilmember Christensen okay. seconded the resolution. Councilmember Martin. Okay. So two things. Um, the first thing is that I have gone through a fairly extensive dialogue with the sustainability staff and the fleet staff. And there is a, they, they have, um, the intention of doing, uh, 
I can't remember what this motion, this motion calls it right now, but anyway, the plan that is called for being developed um, in the, the resolution, um, uh, they have, have um, plans for doing that right after budget. And uh, the other thing is that some of the um, recommendations that we have already voted to, um, I'm not sure what's going on there, um, already voted to incorporate um, into the city's work plan uh, uh, does involve things to help people uh, get electric vehicles, such as group buy programs of either um, used or uh, down level model year vehicles uh, that are not used, but that are not the current year. Um, so uh, we don't necessarily need that in the plan. Um, there, we were displacing horses when we did the oil and gas infrastructure, so it was pretty easy to do it slowly. We're looking at a much faster replacement, and that's part of the reason why um, we need to subsidize the infrastructure, which is what the governor's study from two years ago uh, concluded. So uh, what the only reason this motion is before us now is because it's Drive Electric Week. And the staff was unanimous in, um, in, in saying, we're not ready to do this. Uh, one of the, what just one of the, of the problems that they brought up was that while we are happy to commit to not buying any more internal combustion engine cars, we are not sure that we can uh, commit to retiring them on a schedule. And that's kind of a, an important point. So I don't think we should pass a policy that says you have to retire them on a schedule when we're as in as precarious a position as we are now. So my motion would be that we reconsider this resolution or amendments to this resolution um, uh, on the timing of, this, of, of the uh, fleet and sustainability staff, which is probably four to six weeks, because it doesn't have to be done because it's drive electric week. So do you have a problem with the resolution though? Well, I don't know, because I didn't have time to um, compare what the, the, the staff's rather lengthy comments with this resolution, which just came in and isn't the one that we got from SRL recently or maybe this is the one from SRL recently, um, oh, yeah. but we did get a new one today. Dale, are you clear that no, up? Hold on, time out, time out. Let's go with Council Member Peck, then we're gonna go with Dale, then we're gonna go with Harold. Council Member Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. This resolution is basically to get grant funding. It is not to make any kind of a resolution about what we are gonna do with EV Week, or it's just to, join, it's an IGA, to get grant funding for these charging stations. And I will vote for that. All right. Dale? Uh, Mayor Bagley and uh, Council, um, I believe uh, Council Member Peck has that correct. The item before you tonight is really to accept a grant that we have been awarded by the Regional Air Quality uh, Council to install a, uh, a, a single additional charging station. What I believe council member Martin is referring to is the equitable carbon free transportation map that we intend to bring forward to the council uh, for your discussion and consideration. Um, it'll probably be after the election now, either late October or in November. And that is the item that tied to one of your callers that called in this evening uh, from Sustainable Resilient Longmont, um, encouraging us to uh, sign on to be a, an, an EV um, city. So those are two different issues though. I think tonight is this, this particular item is simply to accept a grant um, for a single charging station. Okay. 
Okay, I was confused because we did hear, have the speakers about GoEV and then we also got an alternative GoEV um, uh, resolution emailed to the council today. So yeah, I am being muddled. I withdraw my motion. I'll let um, somebody All right. move to- All right, there's, there's, there's a current motion on the floor to pass resolution 2020-98. I made it, it was seconded by Council Mark Christensen. Seeing no further debate or discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. Um, did someone pull L? No, right? All right, did somebody pull N? Bright eyes? No, nope, right? And then O, oh, the approved amendment to Boulder Air Contract Addendum. Councilmember Peck. Thank you. I just pulled this actually for some clarification and I talked to Dale earlier this morning. So he, uh, he knows some of the questions I'm gonna ask. We had asked uh, by majority to have the paragraph that basically stated that Air Boulder Air had to give staff seven days notice before any presentation, et cetera, et cetera. And it's been replaced with the uh, two sentences that are that are in our packet and in the resolution stating that staff would like 48 hours before a presentation is made. So I and a couple of, a few of the residents had contacted me that they didn't understand what this meant. So um, I have some questions uh, for Dale, if you, can, if you can clarify this for us and as well as for the public. Um, when we, ask Boulder Air to give us 48 hours before a presentation is made. Tell us why staff wants that. Thank you, uh, uh, Council Member Peck and, and Mayor Bagley. Um, so briefly, what you have in front of you tonight is an amendment to the amendment of the, of the contract. And it's shown on, on the first attachment and it, it's, it's striking out the entire uh, portion of that task three that dealt with the city uh, review and potential denial of, of uh, Dr. Helmig uh, being able to make a presentation and is instead changing that to simply say, provide the city with written notice of publications and or public presentations wherein the city's data will be analyzed or interpreted at least 48 hours prior to the release of the information or at the earliest possible time. And so that is, is really in there in order for us to be alerted to a presentation so that we can alert the council and, and the broad community that a presentation is gonna be made with the city's information. Council, you may want to listen to the presentation. Um, it's really just a heads up. Um, there, it's happening and um, so that there's no surprise, so that a constituent doesn't call you and say, well, what was that about? Or, um, you know, the press usually gets involved. And so we really just didn't want to be caught sort of flat footed. Um, and so again, it's, it's looking for the, 20, uh, the 48 hours or however much time he can provide us. Um, if it's less than that, it's less than that. Um, but that's what we were wanting to accomplish. So Dale, thank you for that explanation. But when you say to analyze the data, um, what, uh, let me see if I can frame this the way, I, the way I'm thinking about it, which is it is not to deny, regardless of what the data says, it is not to deny Boulder Air giving the presentation. Co correct. So Council not Member to hold and data from the public. Correct, Council Member Peck. The staff is neither denying nor are we analyzing. We're simply wanting to have notice that a presentation is going to be made. We do not intend to analyze it. We don't intend to uh, um, proof it. Um, it. It really is simply um, Dr. Helmick sends us an email saying, I have a presentation coming up on, on Thursday. Um, and wanted to let you know. So here's your here's your heads up. We would then subsequently take that, inform the council and the community to the extent that we can, um, because we think it's important information that um, uh, needs to be shared as broadly as we can. But the staff is doing 
no analyzing. Um, we're simply asking that we be notified that it's happening. So no action of the staff, no action of the council. Okay. Uh, prior to the presentations being made. So in this uh, notification from Boulder Air, you do not even need the interpretation of the data. Correct. From Dr. Helmig. Correct. That, we're not asking for that. The Correct. date, the time, and the organization that it's going to be presented to. As much information as he can share, right, to say time and location um, so that we can, again, um, let the council know, let the community know. Okay. Thank you very much. And with that, I move. Uh, oh. I'll second that. Seeing no further discussion. All right. Councilor Martin, go ahead. Um, I'd like clarification as to whether uh, Council Member Peck saying the date, the time, and who we're giving the presentation to is the is intended to be the whole of what Dr. Helmick has to uh, has to notify about because it seems to me that the original intention, um, which just had a promise that we weren't going to stop it, um, was. Uh, so that the staff would have a chance to understand the policy framing that was intended because that the city sh should have a say about. So, I mean, that, I mean before, hold on one second. I'm, I'm not going to call anybody uh, as a point of order, but we have a motion on the floor. The motion is to approve the amendment to Boulder Air Contract Addendum. Everything else in law we call dicta, meaning it's all opinion. There's, a, there's an approved amendment. There's an amendment in our, in our, in our packet. And, and we are, there's currently a motion to approve that amendment. There have been no changes suggested, no motion, motions to alter it. It's as if the consent agenda is gonna pass. I believe we had some questions, they were concern, and concerns, they were addressed. The, the discussion that we could have right now is not gonna matter. Thank you, Mayor Bagley, that was the question I wanted clarified. Okay, so the, there's a motion and a second. So all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, that passes unanimously. Now, I'm not sure, but just to cover Eugene, I move all the consent agenda, catch all. If we miss something, it's all passed, A through P. Do you have a second? Mayor, you're good, you've got them all. Okay, all right, good, okay. Thank you. All. Thanks, Don, <laughs> doing your job. All right, so dare I ask, <laughs> moving on to item 12. Jim, please tell me you've decided to just bail and now you're guilt, there he is. How long is this gonna be? Mayor, I think this could be done in a half hour or less. Great. Then let's go ahead and take a, just a brief break, hit the restroom, grab a Coke, and uh, let's come back and, and uh, let's see how, how good we're, we're all. Let's hope that you're as good as you say you are, Jim. Well, it's Teresa, so I'm putting the pressure on her. Okay, good, good. All right, so we'll be back in three minutes, four minutes. All right.
All right, Susan, can we have our first presentation, please? And next slide. Okay, Mayor and City Council, Teresa Malloy, Budget Manager. So these are the topics we're going to uh, cover for you this evening. Jeff Friesner will be joining us uh, for that second topic. Next slide, please. Each year as part of our um, budget process, staff reviews and, and updates our financial policies. In your council packet, it was attachment L, and that is the complete policies and all of the revisions that we are proposing. Uh, we do have uh, a few of them that we want to um, bring to your attention this evening that go beyond really just minor clarification. Next slide, please, Susan. Uh, the first one, a uh, new policy, is a policy around affordable housing. So this policy essentially uh, lays out the different types of revenue uh, that will be put into the affordable housing fund for affordable housing purposes, including the transfers from the general fund and the marijuana tax fund. Um, it also talks about uh, the city accepting uh, cash, land, and property donations for affordable housing. Next slide, please. Two more new policies, uh, the one around the special marijuana sales tax, uh, which will um, essentially uh, say that half of that will go to the affordable housing fund, and the other half uh, will be allocated uh, as uh, council directs during the annual, annual budget process. The final new policy we wanted to add is uh, a reserve policy for the open space fund. Uh, when we were going through our COVID projections and such, we realized this is uh, one of the funds that we don't have currently a reserve policy for. And so we're proposing to set a 6% reserve policy for this fund. Next slide, please. Uh, we do have a few policies that, as I mentioned, are beyond just a minor clarification. And the first one is in the oil and gas revenue policy to add that last sentence in blue so that we can begin to establish a, a, a reserve in the general fund for oil and gas um, purposes. Next slide, please. And the living wage requirement, this one, uh, we are adding again what's in blue uh, to better align with the actual contract languages that will be um, part of the um, procurement contracts. Next slide, please. And the investment vehicle, adding again that section in blue that one of the vehicles that the city can invest in is general or revenue municipal bonds. Next slide, please. And finally, the last one to bring to your attention is the electric utility reserve. Uh, it, uh, the policy itself is not changing, just a note on the implementation statement that the um, projections for 2021 are that that electric utility will not meet this minimum reserve requirement due to the broadband build out uh, that will be paid back by the electric, oh, I'm sorry, by the broadband utility to the electric utility over a four to five year period, as well as the advanced metering CIP project. Also wanted to note that it is staff's intention, LPC staff's intention to review this policy and look at best practices and uh, likely we'll be updating this policy um, during our budget process for 2022. So those are the um, policies I wanted to bring to your attention. Certainly if you guys have any questions on any of the policies that were in uh, attachment L, we'd be happy to answer those. Uh, Jeff Friesner is going to be up next, unless you have any questions on policies for me. Nope, let's go ahead, Jeff. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Members of Council, Jeff Friesner, Recreation and Golf Manager. 
uh, here to talk a little bit about the proposed reductions for uh, recreation. If uh, Susan, if you could put up uh, presentation number two, please. Thank you. Uh, Teresa just talked about uh, financial policies. There is a financial policy for recreation fees and it requires that we uh, generate 80% self-sufficiency through the fees that we charge for our programs and services. That policy excludes capital uh, items over $5,000. So if we buy a treadmill that costs $4,900, for example, we do have to cost recover it. If it costs $5,000, we don't. Uh, free community events are excluded. Those are events like Rhythm on the River and uh, Longmont Lights. Uh, as, com as to comparis uh, being compared to events like uh, the triathlon lawn and uh, Longmont Turkey Trot, those events we can charge for and, and those events are required to be uh, under the, the policy. Sports field maintenance is marking the fields, maintaining uh, the recreation part of those fields, being ready to play uh, the athletic sports, uh, the visitor center, and then our youth uh, enrichment programs. That's uh, much like our uh, middle, middle school uh, youth soccer program that we do in the spring and the fall. Next slide. So we have uh, found that uh, there's been two major areas that have impacted um, recreation based on the, the, the virus and uh, people coming to the rec center. The first one is the, the guidelines that have been uh, put on our facilities by the state and uh, county public health agencies. Those uh, requirements include uh, a far fewer number of people that can use our facilities at any one time, uh, the requirement that we do not allow drop-in use right now, that it's all uh, done through the reservation system. You have to have a reservation to use the facilities. And then also the requirement to have uh, face coverings. The second item is uh, probably even bigger, is that many people are not uh, feeling comfortable coming indoors. I had a number of emails that requested that we try to keep Sunset Pool open longer this year. Uh, we kept it open two, out, uh, two weeks longer than we normally did, but as the weather gets colder, you know, fewer people uh, come to that facility. And, uh, and so we, we did choose to close that uh, this past Sunday. Just to give you an example, in, a, in normal times, the recreation center has 1,200 people that come through the doors and use the facility each day. Right now, we're averaging about 250 people each day. Uh, next slide, please. So with that, uh, recreation is anticipating that our revenues are going to be down 25% uh, last year or next year, uh, just over a little over $1.1 million. Uh, we believe that uh, the beginning of the year will start slow, but as uh, the, the vaccine becomes available, our numbers will start growing again. Next slide. This slide gives you an example of uh, how our revenue and attendance has been over the last uh, several years. Revenue and, and attendance for this year is down about 33% uh, um, as compared to last year. Next slide, please. So what the budget includes is a 25% uh, reduction in all areas of the uh, budget, excluding regular and part-time benefited uh, employees and the benefits that match that. Uh, we also uh, proposed a 30% reduction in the number of hours that uh, temporary employees would work. Those hours would be backfilled by the regular and part-time benefit employees. We didn't make any specific uh, proposed cuts uh, as far as program budgets. Um, what we will do, uh, next slide please. 
staff will uh, start uh, looking at uh, how we can meet our budget and what programs we can offer based on the budget we would have available. As programs uh, can come back, we would come back to you and try and ask you to appropriate the additional revenues and start adding those programs and activities based on uh, those that uh, can generate the most revenue and would uh, in turn also serve the, the most number of people. Uh, next slide. So I know that was really quick, especially for a $1.1 million reduction, but uh, wanted I can answer any questions you might have. All right, we're good. Let's keep going. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, Susan, if you wouldn't mind putting uh, presentation number three up for me, please. So in our uh, general fund, we have one point, almost $3 million of one-time funding. Um, of, of that, there is 186810 that is funded through the tree mitigation reserve. Those are for the EAB expenses. Um, and we also have a 63,000 of, of one-time expenses that's offset by one-time revenue. So that is 60,000 for oil and gas um, and 3,000 from Boulder County, which is uh, half of the cost of that armored vehicle windshield replacement. And all of our uh, one-time general fund one-time can be found in attachment M and we categorize them by the categories that you see on the screen here. Um, so our net one-time expenses in the general fund is a million and a million forty thousand. Next slide, please. And in the public safety fund, we have a total of seven hundred and seventy-five thousand of one time. Again, we categorize them in the same um, uh, categories as you see on the screen. And uh, the attachment in that was included in your packet is the complete list of all one-time expenses in the public safety fund. Next slide, please. Um, one of our financial policies uh, that I didn't cover with you this evening, but it is in the packet, in our financial policy um, packet is um, the incremental development funding. And uh, there is 756,000, 756 building permits for new dwelling units in our proposed budget. Our financial policy states that anything above a base of 200 new dwelling units is considered incremental development revenue. And so that total amount of incremental development revenue in our proposed budget is $861,098. And that um, comes from essentially two revenue sources, building permits and plan review revenue. Next slide, please. And this slide shows you uh, what is covered um, under those incremental development revenue. It is all ongoing expenses at this um, point. Um, so um, no, no one-time items are being used, uh, are being covered by incremental development revenue. Um, and it is uh, important to note that since they are ongoing expenses, they are subject to reduction at the point that our incremental development revenue uh, will drop off. Um, otherwise, we would have to find another, another revenue source to cover them. Um, so uh, I know Joni is, is here this evening. If you have any questions on any of the incremental development revenue um, items, so, or, or in any um, question on any one time, we also have other staff here that can help answer questions should you have them on any other one-time items. All right, let's keep going. Okay, so uh, the last topic that we have for you this evening then is our, is our public hearing. Um, so Susan, next slide. Um, the, um, the, the announcement was um, advertised in the Times call um, per our city charter. 
Um, and this is this the uh, evening for our first public hearing on our budget. We're going to go ahead and listen to Dr. Waters. Sorry, it's uh, been looking at, it's late. I've been looking at the computer. My eyes are watering. Dr. Waters. Well, uh, what we, I should have had my hand up when, when Teresa right. asked if we had any questions about one-time expenditure. And I, Teresa, I don't have questions about what's listed. I do have a question. I don't think um, I don't think we're, we're are we we're not finishing all the all the proposals or are we finishing all of what I'm sorry all the budget proposals for 2021 we do still have an, one more presentation next week for you yeah so um, uh, whatever we would see next week uh, we've with this list we will have spent all of our one-time money one-time funding in 2021? So, so this list is all of the items that are one-time in nature in the general fund and the public safety fund. I'm, so, my, so let me change the question just a little bit. If we, if we saw proposals next week where we said, uh, we'd like to see more funding for X or Y as a one-time fund, those dollars are all spent or allocated. I, I got you. So, so I think what, as Jim had mentioned previously, we do still have potentially some property tax uh, that could be used from a one-time perspective. Okay. Uh, would, would Mayor Bagley, if I could jump in here as well. It, go ahead. Also, also, the amount of dollars that we recommended go into the stability reserve, you could direct us to lower that and use part of that for one-time expenses. Interesting and, you say that, because I, I made that note whether or not that's even an option, but I appreciate you offering that up as a, as a, <laughs> as at least something to, well, not just as something to think about or as, as an alternative. So th thanks, you answered my question and I'm satisfied. Thank you. All right, let's keep going. Um, let's go ahead and uh, take a two minute break and open it up for a public hearing and we'll come right back. Hey, Don, are, are you on? Of course. So we got an email from somebody that couldn't um, stay for the public hearing. Do we need to read it or can we just provide it to you and the council as part of the public hearing? We could do either, whatever, whatever, whatever you prefer, whatever Mayor Bagley prefers. We can read it or we can email it to council. I think Jim, is that the one about the Ute Creek? Yeah. So Jim did send that to council, just FYI. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's but, that's good. We don't, we don't, we're not, we're not going to start reading things into the record because if people want to attend the public hearing, they can wait and attend the public hearing, but I don't want to start the precedent of right. having, you know, nor, nor did I want to start the precedent of having people short circuit the final public invited to be heard by starting to call in during our, yeah. our public hearing so so Don I'll just forward this to you I've already got it Harold oh I'm you do yeah. okay I just admitted you into the meeting. Um, this uh, particular uh, call-in opportunity is for the public hearing on 
our uh, budget. So if that's what you're calling about, you can stay on. If you're expecting the last public invited to be heard, that is still uh, going to happen um, shortly after. So Susan, I'm just wondering if we could find out. I believe this is the same caller. That's um, what I'm thinking. From final call, we can just um, verify that, I think, and maybe let him stay stay there because final call will come right up next. Okay. Thank you. Hello. How Hello. many pe how many people are or uh how many there, people we are in the queue? We have just one. Um, I was just checking on this guest to see if they're uh, calling for the hearing on the budget or calling in for the final public invited to be heard portion. Well, let's go ahead and that's fine. Well, let's go ahead and oh, let's go ahead and get all the council back. And then um, if somebody calls in by the time this gentleman is done talking, we will we will uh, we will uh, wrap it up. But. Um, he can stay on for just a few minutes because we're if, even if he's not calling in for the budget, we're yes we're close to the final call public invited to be heard. So very good. All right, we're just waiting on Dr. Waters, then we'll go. My apologies. I diminished my screen and could not find a way back into this meeting. I'm you know, Tim, you're always you're you're always late. You're just I'm just apologies. kidding. <laughs> my apologies. No, just kidding. All right. So let's go ahead and open the the public hearing on the 2021 budget. We have one person. Uh, if you'd like to go ahead and state your name and number for the or na name and address for the record, you've got three minutes. Yeah, this is Scott Cunningham. I apologize. I'm I'm actually for the public hearing at the end. Okay, then we'll, we'll go ahead then and just hold on tight for just a second. Um, uh, That's the uh, only caller we have, Mayor. For all right, then we're going to go ahead and close the public invited to be heard. And Jim, if you don't have anything else, we want to thank you and your staff for, for a wonderful job, as always. Thank you. We're done. Thanks. All right, perfect. All right, let's move on to final call public invited to be heard. Um, the gentleman uh, on the line, you've got three minutes. Go ahead. Okay, hi. Um, my name is Scott Cunningham. My address is 3771 South Narcissus Way, uh, Denver, 80237. So I'd like to thank you, Mayor Bagley and city council members for the opportunity to provide uh, input that I hope will be helpful with regard to the use of AMI, uh, proposed AMI smart meters. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, thanks. Uh, my, my comments concern Longmont's stated desire to develop a state-of-the-art sustainable and renewable energy grid to meet the ongoing energy requirements of the members of your community. I urge the council to be extremely cautious in recommending deployment of the advanced metering infrastructure, wireless smart meters, also known as AMI smart meters for several reasons. First, the uh, wireless AMI smart meters are currently felt by leaders of the sustainable energy field to be much less effective in reflecting minute to minute, much less second to second fluctuations in energy supply and demand uh, compared 
with the uh, newer wired smart meters, which are inherently orders of magnitude uh, more responsive. Uh, in addition, these wireless AMI smart meters are uh, actually guaranteed to require costly ongoing maintenance and replacement eventually as, uh, as compared with the wired smart meters. My last comments uh, concern the demonstrated risk of, of um, these wireless smart meters actually catching fire, uh, which you've seen in, in multiple municipalities across our uh, nation over the past several years. And again, I would suggest um, extreme caution, certainly studying this further, but at, at minimum, requiring the supplier to provide proof of insurance against fires caused by these devices and or uh, certificates of safety. Certainly, uh, the city does not relish the thought of being liable for fire damages brought about what uh, many authorities would say is inferior and even inherently unsafe equipment. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you, sir. See, uh, I'm assuming nobody else is in the queue. That is correct, Mayor. All right, great. Then let's go on to Mayor and Council comments. Councilmember Christensen. Uh, you're you're muted, Councilmember. And Marsha Martin, you're next. So I want you to get off, like pumped out on that arm. Sorry, I need a better go. lamp in, in here. <laughs> um, so this is about things to do in Longmont. Um, this weekend or last weekend uh, on either Friday or Saturday, I went over to the museum, um, which was uh, helping Tony um, Ortega um, paint five murals that are, that are going to be installed. And um, Tony Ortega is a wonderful artist. You cannot look at his work and not feel delighted by life. It's even when it's a sad subject, it's, they're, they're beautiful. He's done uh, paintings and murals and children's book illustrations and many things. He's been, he's one of Colorado's best artists. Um, so I painted uh, some blue bones, which are gonna be overpainted. This was just an underpainting. This is a group project for a mural and it was really interesting and really a lot of fun, a lot of nice people. And it's just one of the many, many things that the museum does. And uh, I, I also would urge everybody to go to the opening ceremony of the, Di, Di, uh, the Dia de los Muertos, um, October 1st at the museum. It's always a wonderful time to remember, reflect on life. This is a particularly good year to reflect on life and death. And all the people who have died that you love this year, including some who are well known, like John Lewis and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but we've also all lost our own, our own family and friends. Um, the other thing that the museum is doing is uh, at 7.30 on Thursday, they are having a talk by Cleo Parker Robinson. Cleo Parker Robinson has been, um, this is a 50 year celebration of her work. She's been uh, one of the leading dancers, I mean, dance companies in Colorado and she has promoted dance, uh, particularly African-American uh, culture for the last 50 years. She's an incredible person. She's a delightful human being. So I would suggest you tune into that. Anyway, that's all I got. All right, um, who else? Council Member Martin, sorry, it's late, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, somewhat aligned with something Paul said, I think we would be remiss not to acknowledge that today the United States officially passed the total of 200,000 deaths from COVID-19. And uh, I guess on a virtual meeting, a moment of silence is not all that meaningful. So let's just all 
acknowledge that this has happened and acknowledge the people that are fighting against it, especially our local heroes, including our city service staff and our medical workers uh, here in Longmont. So it's a sad day. All right. Um, I don't see any other hands. I'll, I'll, before I get to you, Dr. Waters, I was, uh, it's too late, but, and, and I don't think anybody, do you guys know what Rick rolling is? I think Aaron's yes. going to, anyway, I was going to Rick roll you guys tonight because he, he, Rick Aston died today. So I was going to like throw it up in the middle of the meeting, but I figured that most of you guys would be like, what are you doing? So anyway, Aaron, it would have been funny to you and maybe you would have been funny. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but anyway. All right. Uh, anybody else? Dr. Waters, let's give you the last word. Thanks. Um, so with apologies to council members, I'm going to, I'm going to, my last comments are going to be a, a, a little sharper um, and point pointed uh, than, than the council member Martin's uh, very thoughtful reflection on the, the number of Americans who we've lost to, due to this pandemic. Um, but I do want to start my my comments by asking, is Sandy Cedar still on the call? Hi, Council Member Waters, I sure am. Uh, Sandy, you shared an e email with us uh, this last week um, reporting to us uh, a recommendation from Boulder County, the De Boulder County Democratic Party relative, uh, relative to the ballot question that will be on the ballot, 3D, to, to change or amend the Longmont City Charter. Um, and I'm just curious because that what I saw was the Boulder County Democrats encouraging people to vote against our local charter, proposed charter amendment change. Is that correct? Yes, that's true. That is what they publicized in an e-newsletter last week. And uh, did you receive any inquiries from, from them about our thinking, the rationale, um, or, or an invitation to make any kind of presentation to anybody? I did not receive any um, questions or opportunities to speak, and I did check in with our presentation team, and neither did they. So a position um, they took without any input from us, other than what they've heard or read in the paper or heard from other Boulder County Democrats. Is that fair? I would say that's a fair assessment. Um, so... I want to say to Boulder County Democrats that your arrogance and disrespect of Longmont and elected officials is insulting, at least to this council member. Boulder County, Boulder County Democrats clearly believe, based on what I read, that Longmont City Council members and the city manager are not smart enough to design public-private partnerships that serve the interests of Longmont residents, taxpayers, and investors. I guess Longmont residents, based on the thinking of Longmont or, uh, or Boulder County Democrats, not Longmont Democrats, should be grateful that Boulder County Democrats want to save us from ourselves. Boulder County Democrats, non-elected officials or non-elected folks that they are, and unaccountable to Longmont voters, obviously believe their fear that council members lack the intelligence and responsibility to negotiate agreements with investors that do not award unnecessary subsidies to developers while undervaluing city of Longmont owned property are compelling reasons for partisan opposition to a nonpartisan ballot question to change the city charter. Boulder County Democrats apparently also believe ballot questions voted down by Longmont voters in one election cycle should not again appear on a subsequent ballot. If this thinking was sound, next light would not exist since it was not supported by the voters of Longmont when initially placed on a ballot. And applying the Boulder County Democrats rationale for voting no on the charter change, would, they would recommend that Longmont's voters vote against the development of what is now acknowledged as one of Longmont's great assets and the envy of municipalities virtually everywhere, including the city of Boulder. So Boulder County Democrats, in the interest of an informed, balanced, respectful, and nonpartisan local election, reconsider your position. Thank you. All right, then let's go ahead and uh, say, Harold, do you have anything to say? 
Um, real quick, I just I missed this earlier. Um, I know Sandy sent out an email talking about council coffee with council in October in a virtual for format. What we heard from council is you all would rather wait and consider that for January um, than try to stick that in in the in the, the last um, coffee with council in October. Just wanted to to confirm that with you all and let you know that we will evaluate for January depending on where we are um, in this situation. All right, uh, Eugene. No comments, Mayor. All right, with that, can I have a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn. Thank you, Councilor okay. Peck. I'll, I was going to second it. <laughs> All right, it's been Aww. moved by Councilmember Peck, seconded by Councilmember Martin. We're getting out of here at ten forty. It's great. It's four eleven. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. And that motion passes unanimously, and I will see you guys at the latest next Tuesday. All right, later, guys. Thanks for your help.